ready? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. If this is the August 4th uh, meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council, we'll call it to order. Um, I will ask our deputy clerk to call the roll. Our deputy clerk. McQueen. <laughs> what? Are you present? I guess. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you meant I was the deputy clerk. Yes. yes. No, so. Oh. <laughs> here. Asklin? Yes. yes. And I guess I should say that it's official. We swore her in. Judy and I, we had lots of uh, 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 witnesses. We swore her in the day Judy left or the day before Judy left for her vacation. So Patty decided she didn't want just one job in Yellow Springs, that she had to have at least two. So I'm an overachiever. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Let's see. Uh, first, uh, after that, we have announcements. Any announcements from Council? Well, I noticed in the packet that Home Inc. had an announcement, and I noticed that Emily's here, so I thought maybe she could make the announcement about the... Sure. Three minutes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Seibold, Director of Yellow Springs Home Inc., and I'm just very excited to invite everyone to our groundbreaking ceremony scheduled for Friday, August 15th at 3.30 p.m. Um, for the first phase of Cemetery Street. And so, of course, we invite all the council members and members of the general public to attend. Refreshments will be served. Um, you'll get to meet the homebuyer family. Um, and I just want to say also the village support has been critical in leveraging additional funding. Um, so far, your support has helped to bring in nearly $170,000 to the village. Um, so we hope everyone can make it, and there will be golden shovels. It's really great. So excited. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, anything else? OK. Um, we'll do the minutes uh, of uh, July 21st. And there are a lot of them. Yes. Uh, page one. Page two, page three, page four, page five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, one thing on 11. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the second to last paragraph, um, and it says uh, HRC and will provide an intern. And I think probably we should change that is hopes to have an intern, because we'll be applying for that. I am not seeing the intern. Uh, down near the it's bottom. The Intern hopes to have that one. Right Fifth line up from the bottom. Oh, okay. Hopes to have an intern. Okay. Uh, page twelve. Pretty amazing. Judy will be very happy. <laughs> one uh, one change on there are twelve. Or a pages. couple typos, but I'll send them. Send them. Thank I will you. not. <laughs> Thank I will you. not go over them. I <laughs> Uh, uh, I'll take a motion to accept. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next is petitions and communications. Uh, Lori, can you review those? Yep. Um, well, we got a note from Green County Commissioners about uh, electrical aggregation. I don't think this is probably something that we are ourselves going to be interested in. It's basically allowing for bulk purchasing for energy for all residents of the county, especially in the townships. But we're already part of a co-op, so um, and we have a portfolio that emphasizes renewable energy. So I'm not expecting that we will pursue it, but it is in our package. Um, and. Uh, Emily Seibel sent in the announcement of the ground baking ceremony and also um, a notification that households that have incomes up to 175% of the poverty level can qualify for assistance with electric utility bills. So 
um, and that uh, the qualifications are that somebody in the house has to have a documented medical condition or somebody in the house needs to be over 60. Um, there's also a notification about a 9-11 spirit climb on the Antioch campus and we also had information from the Tecumseh Land Trust um, a proposal to apply for funding to use Clean Ohio's open space <coughs> uh, funds to clear uh, space uh, along the Yellow Springs Creek behind the Bryan, Bryan Center, so just up there. Um, and uh, they believe we are uh, likely to be successful, but um, uh, Manager Bates has expressed concerns about the expense of maintenance and how that would be funded. And, and so we will have a bit of time to talk during your report. I think that, uh, well, we can do that, but I think that also um, Krista is coming to the right. next meeting. Yeah, I, 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 I just wanted to save. It, it seems, it, it, it just doesn't seem appropriate to talk about why we shouldn't do a project or the issues around a project before it's been formally presented by the proposer. Uh, on the other hand, I think that sometimes uh, it's important for the public to know ahead of time when something's coming because I think one of the things that happens is people tend to learn after a decision has already been made and then it's too late. So I, I don't think we should be, I'm not suggesting we deliberate it about it, but I, I would like during uh, Patty's report to just talk about it a little bit so that people in the community who are interested and might have some input okay. have, have a little bit of lead time and we'll also have when we talk about agenda planning we'll also have it okay. be putting it on the agenda cool. and they'll know about that then um, and I would like to point out the um, Lori mentioned the 9-11 uh, stair climb it is being um, sponsored by Miami Township Fire and Rescue so Colin is putting it together it's in North Hall the equivalent of 110 stories so I'm sure you're all going to be up for that um, but it just sounds like a great it's a lot of steps so it's it's up one side of North Hall across the hall down and it actually happens to be the day of students new students arriving so that's wow. going to be quite a day um, so but it, it goes to, the money goes to a good cause it goes to the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation so I would like to encourage all of you who um, are so inclined to look um, up that information they have a Facebook page um, we're moving on to public hearing public hearings and legislation first we have ordinance 2014-20 repealing ordinance 2014-16 determining to proceed with the center for business and education public improvement project and to authorize the village maintain the village manager to retain bond council and solicit bids from contractors patty whereas the village council previously approved ordinance 2014-16 determining to proceed with the center for business and education public improvement project and to authorize the village manager to retain bond council and solicit bids from contractors the ordinance and whereas a referendum petition seeking the repeal of ordinance 2014-16 the petition was circulated by the electors of the village and whereas the village council determined on July 21st 2014 that the petition appeared to be valid subject to the certification of the elector signatures by the Green County Board of Elections <laughs> and whereas pursuant to the village of Yellow Springs Charter section 70 the Village Council must either pass a measure repealing Ordinance 2014-16 or take the necessary action to submit the petition to referendum vote of the Village electors. And whereas this emergency ordinance is being passed pursuant to Section 70 of the Charter of Yellow Springs, that requires the Village Council to pass this repealing measure or take action necessary to submit Ordinance 2014-16 to a vote of the Village electors. Now, therefore, the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, Green County, hereby, hereby ordains that. Section 1. The Council of the Village of Yellow Springs hereby repeals Ordinance 2014-16, making the petition moot and avoiding a referendum on the ordinance. Section 2. This Council finds and determines that all formal actions of this Council and any of its committees concerning and relating to the passage of this ordinance were adopted in an open meeting of this Council and that all deliberations of this Council and any of its committees that resulted in those formal actions were in meetings open to the public, all in compliance with the law. Section 3. This ordinance is hereby declared to be an emergency measure immediately necessary to preserve the public interest as guaranteed by the village of the Yellow Springs Charter. Thank you. Can I have a motion? 
I move. Second. Um, just to, it is, this is very confusing. Um, there are two pieces of legislation that we have tonight related to the Center for Business and Education. And as this says a couple of times in the language of the ordinance, it relates to our charter. Our charter requires us, um, when there is a referendum petition filed, which there was in this situation, our charter requires us to come back to council, <coughs> give council the opportunity to rescind that ordinance and basically say we are not going forward with the legislation that the referendum was submitted against. Um, so, um, and then there's another piece of, uh, I won't talk about the other piece of legislation yet, but, but that is, so, so a no vote on this means that we do not rescind that ordinance and that the referendum can go forward. A yes vote would mean, a majority yes vote would mean that we would rescind the ordinance and the project would be done at least in the iteration that it is right now um, with pro the proposal that the village will um, spend money on the infrastructure. So that's a, did I explain it? That's, it's, it apparently our charter and this requirement is relatively unusual as our, uh, as our solicitor pointed out. So it may be something we want to change. Um, it basically just gives council one last opportunity to avoid a referendum if we would <coughs> so choose. Um, and, and it is an emergency because of the fact that the filing for the referendum has to happen by November 6th, uh, excuse me, by November August, August, August 6th <laughs> um, for order. the November election. So um, that's why it's, it's an emergency. Um, it, I, I don't feel like even though this, this particular discussion has been, um, has been, you know, has been somewhat controversial. There's been a lot of discussion. I don't consider this particular piece of legislation to be controversial. So I, I don't think citizens should be concerned about the emergency language of this particular ordinance. Um, it's basically for expediency. Um, so I, I just want to clarify that everyone understands that a yes vote repeals ordinance 2014-16 and a no vote moves the referendum, potentially moves the referendum forward with the next piece of legislation. <coughs> and the emergency, <coughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because um, this actually, I wasn't thinking about this as I was looking at the packet, requires f a supermajority, correct? So it requires four? I believe that's correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, <coughs> um, and the other, th the other issue is, and I know you, you don't want to talk too much about the next um, resolution, but it's my understanding that we are required to pass one or the other. That is correct. Also. Right. So we either have to repeal the ordinance or we have to decline to repeal the ordinance. Well, we have to vote on both pieces of legislation. There just has to be a yes vote on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and as Lori points out, because this is an ordinance and because it is an emergency, there does have to be super majorities, that, which means normal vote would be three to two. This would have to have a minimum four to one vote um, to, to uh, well, no, that's, well, to, that's to be approved. Yeah, to be approved. I, I do have a question, and I, I also only just noticed this now. This one is called an ordinance, and this one is called a resolution. Resolutions. And I guess it's because an this ordinance a, to repeal an, an ordinance. ordinance an ordinance requires an ordinance but declining to repeal an ordinance only requires resolution right, correct. so okay one more question <laughs> maybe we should have our lawyer here um, ordinances definitely require the supermajority yes do resolutions I don't believe so <coughs> no, <coughs> resolutions don't because it's not an emergency correct you, okay you pass them in one reading right and um, I guess I would you know since I don't know if a soup if you need a supermajority no vote, you need a supermajority yes vote to to approve right. it. <coughs> okay. You know, I don't think you need the supermajority to Okay. To vote no, to, right. to, to decline. We would need four to we rescind. We would need to rescind, but we would only need three to to decline. To decline. Okay. Yes. Okay. So there's a higher there's basically a higher standard applied to ordinances because 
they're, they're more powerful pieces of legislation, right? Uh, I don't know how to explain. I don't have good <laughs> legal language, but so everything is a bit more like weighty when we're working with ordinances. So that's why there's there's got to be four of us for this ordinance because we're repealing something that we already said we were going to do. So that for takes a yes. for a yes vote. Right. If we if we were to approve this this current um, ordinance that we're uh, that is before us. Um, comments from council questions um, well yeah I I, um, I am concerned that the ref that the referendum will be successful and um, I uh, I am concerned that it, if it is successful that 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 will mean um, at no time in the future will the village be able to put any money toward the CBE, or at least that's how I understand it, or at least put any money toward the infrastructure. Um, I do think that at some point in time, um, I think that the village and community resources could be uh, in a better position to um, have a referendum happen. Um, so I am inclined to vote yes for this, and I imagine I am a minority of one. <laughs> what, what I would say to that, though, is your concern about um, the future of the project is that this only, a yes vote on this or rescinding this is only this particular iteration of the, ordin of the ordinance, the previous ordinance. It doesn't say we will never fund um, the CBE. It is the particular ordinance that we voted on before. But she is concerned, I, I, if I'm hearing Marianne correctly, she's not concerned about that so much as concerned. I'm concerned that, that, that uh, in a, be taken say a year from, from now, um, we have a, we really have a, a lot of interest in the CBE and it really looks like it could be a go and it does need, and, and it could use some help from the village. That if that were the case, w the village would not be able to. See, I don't believe, I. I don't think that you would be legally constrained from from passing another ordinance. I think that you may have the same response, but I don't think you would be legally constrained from doing it. I mean, it's just in some respects, it's similar to the to the to the referendum on the glass farm. That referendum was against that a singular project. It didn't say there will never be. Hmm development of glass farm so the council could come back however many times just it like wants for, to yes presumably with the similar okay right. all right okay. um this is a, a second read or it's a public hearing i will open the public hearing for comments sue please state your name and you have uh, three minutes won't need that <laughs> <laughs> sue Avendroth. i believe that when you voted to uphold or to do the funding it was in order that that vote was from what I observed taken on the basis that there would be a referendum that's a promise to the citizenry I think that's sure what it looked like those are the arguments that you used so at this point to not allow for the referendum to go forward, I think is a is a, a, a misuse of the citizens' interest. Another reason is that the citizenry needs to know whether this village supports the CBE or not. And there's no other way to really know whether this village wants to invest in a CBE or not. And I think you owe it to the citizens of this village to let them have that answer. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Comments? Any other comments? Chrissy. I'm Chrissy Cruz. Um, I agree with Sue. I want to say that when my, I was, we were collecting signatures for the petitions, um, I was amazed at how easy it was. Some people told me that every single door they knocked on, the people signed the petition. And we made a point of telling people that it was to get this issue on the ballot. So I would urge you to let it go to referendum because that way we'll be following through on our promise that we made when we collected the signatures too. And I think the village does need to speak on this issue, so. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Seeing and hearing none, I will bring it back to council table for any final comments from council. Patty, would you please call the roll? On ordinance 2014 20. McQueen? No. Housh? No. Sims? No. Askeland? No. Wintrow? No. Thank you. <coughs> uh, now we're moving on to resolution 2014 37 declining to repeal ordinance 2014 16 and authorizing the ordinance to proceed to a referendum. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs Council voted to enact Ordinance 2014-16 determining to proceed with the Center for Business and Education Public Improvement Project and to authorize the Village Manager to retain Bond Council and solicit bids from contractors and whereas a referendum petition seeking to repeal Ordinance 2014-16, the petition, was circulated by electors of the village and the petition was submitted to the Village Council for the purpose of determining whether the petition was valid on its face and Whereas the Village Council determined on July 21st, 2014 that the petition appeared to be valid subject to the certification of the elector's signatures by the Greene County Board of Elections and whereas pursuant to Village of Yellow Springs Charter Section 70, the Village Council must either pass a measure repealing Ordinance 2014-16 or take the necessary action to submit the petition to a referendum vote of the Village electors. Now, therefore, the, village, uh, the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1. The petition seeking a referendum on Ordinance 2014-16 is valid subject to the certification of the elector's signature by the Greene County Board of Elections. Section 2. The Village Council, having considered whether to repeal Ordinance 2014-16, declines to do so by this resolution. Section 3. The petition shall be submitted to the Greene County Board of Elections on or before August 6, 2014 for the purpose of placing the referendum on the ballot for the November 2014 election to be considered by the village electors. Section 4. This resolution shall be in full force and effect upon its adoption. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, I think the uh, language is pretty self-explanatory as we said before this is basically um, we've already declined um, to, to rescind the resolution this is pushing the the referendum forward saying we support the referendum and allowing it to move forward um, questions comments citizens questions or comments I'll bring it back to council for a vote um, Patty why don't you call the roll on this one McQueen Yes. Housh? Yes. Sims? Yes. Askland? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Thank you. Um, moving on to resolution 2014-38, authorizing the village manager to enter into a purchase agreement with Brooks Associates for street lights for the Central Business District. Whereas the Village Council desires to improve street lighting on Xenia Avenue in the Central Business District, and whereas Council also desires to complete the improvements on Dayton Street and the west side of Xenia Avenue begun in 2006 and furthered in 2012 by installing planned street lighting there to match the existing upgraded street lighting in the Central Business District. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, that <coughs> Section 1, the village manager is authorized to enter into an agreement with Brooks Associates for the purchase of street lights as specified by the village manager in amount not to exceed $100,000. Section 2, the village manager is authorized to seek at least two quotes from distributors for the purchase of street lights described above and to contract for the purchase of the same with the lowest and best conforming offer. Section 3, this resolution shall go into effect at the earliest period allowed by law. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Patty, I'll let you talk about this, or I, I see that Johnny's here also. Um, this is um, simply to purchase the rest of the street lights uh, to finish the streetscape completely uh, in order to match the ones that we already have. Um, Johnny had some concerns that they would either, number one, increase fairly dramatically in price, or number two, uh, the design may change and we may not be able to get exactly the same lights. Um, he's been able to find them. Uh, he has two suppliers, um, and the uh, the lowest and most conforming offer will be the one that we choose. So, questions? Yeah, um, 
What, given that we're getting the new lights, are there some qualities about the new lights that are better than the old lights? I, you mean the ones that, the old ones that are still there that need to be replaced yeah. in, in relation to the new ones? All right. Johnny, can you? <clears throat> The new style is LED, which is the new modern technology that we have down Dayton Street. Mm -hmm. The other is inductance light, and we've been having a lot of problems here with them, but it will actually bring the light closer to the ground, mm -hmm. and it'll be, the ground will be lit up more. And there's less maintenance and a lot of energy savings. Okay. Well, I, I think that the light poles themselves are also significant because they're they're a, co a concrete composite correct. material right and, steel. and now the steel I mean a lot we've actually had to remove right. some of those light posts because the steel base is correct. completely so rotted out corroded. or rus rusting out so um, that's another significant feature of the lights correct. thanks questions or comments from citizens Seeing and hearing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, moving on to uh, resolution 214-39, authorizing um, approving filing an application for financial assistance under the Nature Works program. Whereas the state of Ohio through the Ohio Department of Natural Resources administers financial assistance for public recreation purposes through the state of Ohio Nature Works program, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs desires financial assistance under the Nature Works program, now therefore be it resolved by the village of Yellow Springs that the village of Yellow Springs approves the filing of an application for financial assistance. Section 2, that Patty Bates is hereby authorized and directed to execute and file an application with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and to provide all information and documentation required to become eligible for possible funding assistance. Section 3, that the Village of Yellow Springs does agree to obligate the funds required to satisfactorily complete the proposed project and become eligible for reimbursement under the terms of the Nature Works program. Okay. Um, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, Patty, would you um, talk about this project? Um, the NatureWorks program um, essentially provides funding for um, anything related to recreation. Specifically, what we are asking for is um, funding to put new playground equipment both at this building and at Gonk Park for the children. Um, what this building would get would be two pieces of equipment, one specifically for toddlers and another one slightly larger for older children. And uh, the one at Gaunt Park would be for, I believe it's five to 12 year old children. Um, the good thing about NatureWorks is it's a 75% reimbursement grant. 25% um, would be village, but we are allowed to submit for in-kind labor as part of our contribution. Um, we would be um, assembling this equipment ourselves and that would help us towards the in kind. So in dollar figures, what the village would essentially be required to um, finance uh, out of a total of uh, $41,352, the village would be required to uh, contribute $9,676 plus the in kind labor to assemble all three pieces of equipment. And that grant is due September 1st. Um, questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? I'm Nadia Malarkey, um, Yellow Springs. And uh, I'd just like to know what are the products made of, especially with the toddler playground equipment? Um, they're all from MMI Outdoor. Um, and I have the specifications if you'd like to look at them. Um, the one for the younger children um, is called a Discovery Center. Um, I am trying to see, it, it doesn't tell me specifically what it's made of. Um, it probably does somewhere, yeah. like deeper in the specs maybe. Yeah, just not on the page that, um, that Jason gave me. It says, uh, what it says is, uh, Discovery Centers help meet best practices and licensing requirements and early childhood program standards. 
maximum play value in a variety of developmental and educational activities, encourage children to learn, grow, and lead healthy lifestyles. All Discovery Centers exclusively fe feature a touch math learning panel and curriculum for bringing learning outdoors. Uh, touch math is an award-winning multi-sensory math curriculum. Um, but it, that, unfortunately, it doesn't tell me on this piece of paper what the, the actual composite is. You can get some information after maybe. Okay. Uh, any other comments? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I am going to recuse myself for this next piece of legislation and turn it over to Lori. Okay, so this is resolution 2014-40 and I'm gonna let Patty read this one aloud also in all of its entirety and then that offer some explanation to the people. Resolution selecting Ted Donnell architect to evaluate the roof structure of the Yellow Springs Library building. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs budgeted $30,000 for a building renovation of the Yellow Springs Library building, and whereas the Village of Yellow Springs is ready to proceed with the next phase of that evaluation, and whereas Ted Donnell Architect had previously been selected to provide those evaluation services through a sealed bid process, and whereas it is the recommendation of staff that we proceed with the evaluation process using the services of Ted Donnell Architect. Now therefore the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby resolves that Section 1, the Village of Yellow Springs selects the architecture firm of Ted Donnell Architect to continue the evaluation process of the Yellow Springs Library Building. Section 2, the Village Manager is authorized to enter into an agreement with Ted Donnell Architect for those services in an amount not to exceed $10,000 with the authority to approve such change orders as may be needed in the project to conclude the project effectively. Section 3, this resolution shall become effective immediately upon its adoption. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Do you want to speak to the um, resolution? This was um, a project that was begun uh, before I got here uh, to evaluate the building in phases. The sealed bid specifically listed different sections of the building that were to be evaluated in each phase. Um, one of the things that was listed in the sealed bid was the roof. Um, we are now ready to proceed with evaluation of that roof so that we can get hopefully the new roof on it before the fall hits and uh, this resolution authorizes me to go ahead and proceed with that. Um, and it's my recollection from budgets past that there have been problems and we've done multiple repairs on the roof. It's a flat roof and uh, this will restructure the That's roof correct. so that it's no longer a flat roof and not so prone to leaking. Um, it'll still maintain the same you know, image from the outside, it won't look different. We're not going to put a big mansard roof or something <laughs> on it. Um, so it will still look like the same building, but it will, the, the roof will be architecturally structured so that it is less likely to have all of these problems. Right. It will be slightly angled so that the water will run off from it and it will have the appropriate drainage. And, and uh, we're also going to clean the parapets while we're doing this. So clean the, the, the parapets at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is, well, this is a project, the re renovations on the building have been going on for yeah. some period of time, and Ted has been involved. Correct, yes. and they've just been done in phases. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it was originally put out for sealed bid, um, the, these renovations were included in that original sealed bid as part of it, and um, I believe he was also the sole, sole sealed bid uh, that was submitted when it was done at least that's what the records tell me so why I, why if he's already been approved why each, do we have to each phase him? is being approved approve as it separately. goes yeah okay. it just it keeps it very transparent is the uh, is the idea um but it so it's as i understood it uh, patty called me to talk to me about about this um it's sort of a belts and braces approach that um there was a <coughs> there was a little ambiguity i think in just the way certain things were worded. So to be on the safe side, Patty mm -hmm. felt uh, it was a good idea to just make it clear that this is what we're doing. And Patty, you did say the goal is still to get the roof fixed 
before by this fall, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's why we need to move forward. Right. Okay. Well, I want to. Um, are there any other questions or comments from council? I want to go ahead and, and open for public comments. Um, we have we a already motion. have a motion and a second, um, so we're we're there. Um, but if there's any public comments on the on the substance of the resolution, all right. Seeing and hearing none, uh, I'll take it back to council for a vote. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, the same sign. All right, the ayes have it. Um, Karen can come back <laughs> into the room if somebody wants to see if she's out down the hall somewhere. Hey, uh, next thing on the agenda is um, citizens' concerns, and uh, that is for anything that is uh, not on the agenda as a discussion item already. Um, comments, citizen comments. Um, Kate. Kate, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I went blank. Sorry. It happens. Uh, hi, I'm Kate Hamilton. I just wanted to ask Council. Um, I was a little dismayed to see that. Our village is part of a SWAT team and that there seemed to be a disconnect between <coughs> being part of this and village council being aware of it. Um, I know that we are also part of the ACE task force, I think since 2005, and I believe that uh, each year it's discussed whether or not we continue uh, being part of that, but I don't know how that process works. I was curious about that, and I would also like to ask council uh, to maybe think about having um, more of an open dialogue between the police department, the village council, and the citizens to see um, what direction we want to head with our police force. You know, I'm, I'm confused with the different SWAT teams and drug task force and things like that, and I would, I would hope that there would be more dialogue. I wish we could open that up more. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Other comments? Uh, um, yeah, Joan. Come on, Joan. Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> I have those days. Hi, uh, Joan Edwards. My um, question still is about what's going on with the resolution to permanently um, prevent the village from spraying. It's on the agenda. agenda Is that tonight. on the agenda? Yes. yes. Under old business. old business. I missed that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Um, Kate, I'm not, not to, um, I think that, um, one time, you know, I don't know how council feels. I mean, I know this is probably something, you know, just the big article in the paper is it something we want to have it bring in as a discussion item at some point um, I think it can definitely be addressed during when we talk about budgeting um, and how we how, how the chief proposes to budget the police department this year um, I, I think it is something worth discussion not at this meeting necessarily but um, I think that the more the community understands what the police department, what it's involved in, and what the philosophy is, the better the community can work with the police. Um, I mean, the police are so critical to the community for protection, but the, the more the community understands, I think, and the more, the more neighbors talk to each other and the more people communicate with the police, the better off we are. And so I, I would like to see it um, more of a discussion of the SWAT team, the drug task force, and just general policing. And maybe, it was, I don't know, a couple decades ago, the mediation program had a forum in which police and community members were able to come together and, and share 
share concerns, share information, and I felt that was helpful. And I think periodically something like that is a good thing to do. I think it, it, en it engages the community. It makes people feel closer to the police department, I think. So I, I, at some point during this calendar year, I'd like to see something, some discussion of how to, how to do that to keep communication open. I, I guess I, I've been out of town, unfortunately, and I was not aware that we, we had a SWAT team. We don't we, have a SWAT we team. Don't. We, we don't have a SWAT team. We at one time had a member who was on, was on, the, SWAT on the SWAT team. Um, he currently is not. We do not currently have a member on the SWAT team. Right. However, SWAT will respond as mutual aid for us if the need arises. Right. So. And, and we, for a few years now, we have been part of the drug task force. Right. That's and correct. provided officers. That's okay. correct. Okay. Just want to make sure I didn't miss something. I think it would make sense to have this discussion, um, and probably HRC might be the logical body to organize it. Sometimes we have people from village mediation, uh, if they're willing to volunteer to uh, sort of MC the event, um, that sometimes is a good resource for that. Um, I also think ideally it would be good to have um, such a discussion actually before the budget because mm -hmm. budget there's a zillion things in a budget and it's and there's never really time to actually discuss those elements in the way that they need to be so well, that would mean given this the the schedule that's being proposed later on in the session that we're going to be discussing ideally sometime in September right yeah HRC is meeting this Thursday and yeah we'll definitely put it on the agenda okay. to talk about how we might organize that and in the past um, many of our HRC meetings we've had uh, the chief sergeants that have attended to you know talk to the community so uh, so I'll invite them as well okay. Patty do you know if in in the remainder of 2014 if there are plans to assign another officer to the SWAT team there are, at this time there are no plans to assign another officer to SWAT I guess I would suggest that we not that 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 would be we would hold off on that if there was any plan to do that before and, we would assign a new officer and the nature of that participation was training right I mean it was eight hours a month or something well yes initially initially there was a little bit more uh, training involved in it um, and there was the the purchase of the proper equipment and the weapon which was done with forfeiture funds is my understanding right and then um, the training was um, one day a month um, and the officer was only allowed to go when um, he was on it was his regular duty day and there was other sufficient coverage <coughs> on the road so if um, if the officer came in he was the only officer on the road he was not allowed to go to SWAT he was required to stay here and cover the road um, if there were other officers to cover the road then he was allowed to go to the, to the SWAT training but it did not incur overtime is my understanding <coughs> what, if, what if there was an emergency call was he required to respond he I, I haven't asked that specific question but my thought would be he would be required to come back yes okay so I think I think we'll have this discussion probably in the next couple of months our budget schedule has a starting budget in October the beginning of October so um, okay but Thank, those oh. dis there were there's two distinct discussions one is you know a discussion with the police in the in the village as to how they, they police and so forth there'd be a separate one with the chief and Patty determining what the year's requirements would be and be submitted in the budget. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure people don't get those two confused because they may come up with some things they'd like to do right. as a result of that discussion right. Right. but may not be what the chief and Patty decides. Right. Okay. Sure, Kate. Um, I ask a okay. I'm not sure if my um, math is right here. I think it's $10,500 a year to be on the drug task force, plus the salary of a full-time officer. Um, and there's four or five of the communities on the drug task force. And we get an eighth of uh, 
what's taken in, what's you know surrendered or the forfeiture. Yeah. Forfeiture. And I'm wondering, is that part of the budget when the chief submits a budget to you? Is that like a certain fund? Because I know the fund is used for um, area use and things like that. In right. The past. Yeah. Normally, forfeiture money. Um, has its own line or you you can differentiate it um, I haven't looked specifically at chief's budget to tell you what that line is it's but you furtherance are, of justice it's right the furtherance and, of justice and it is fund. very restricted in what it can be used well, for. and I don't believe he budgets he does not he does not um, include it any you know it's just like a state tax when we when we could get a state tax it was you would never know each year how much we would get so he doesn't include it as he does not a number part of his, as part he, of his he regular can spend budget it, but he doesn't count on it right okay. he count it, what what is what appears in that line is what's available in the fund okay. at the time that the but I, if I recall right. correctly okay. at the time that the budget is being done okay. um, I'm so curious if we no, sort of Sorry, break even or that's a good do you know what I'm saying with that's the a good question that that we spend I, on I, I think we're getting into the weeds a little bit Sorry, more I just without, wanted to yeah that clarified I, sort of. I think this can all that can be <coughs> part okay. of this next discussion okay, thank you. Yeah. thanks any other um, next on the agenda is special report I see uh, mr. Sam young sitting here to give us an update on Camp Green I am Sam Young, and I'm here from Glen Helen Association, in this case. Um, last January, I believe it was January, I came to this group asking for a resolution of support for a grant application. Um, it was from the Clean Ohio Fund, and the purpose was for Glen Helen Association to purchase Camp Green, the Girl Scout camp. We had decided it was one of three that was to be sold. Um, it's just been enough time that I thought you deserved an update on what that is. Uh, we have recently received uh, notice that the grant has been awarded. Wow. Uh, that's a $400,000 grant. Wow. Um, they have um, a commitment to a significant gift from the Upper River Fund of the Dayton Foundation uh, toward the balance of it. And there is... Um, there are some additional things we have to do to satisfy the grant process and the grant application. We're committed to removing honeysuckle from the <laughs> property, uh, which is a big job. Mm -hmm. But we did, we were allowed to include that as a cost in the grant application. Okay. Um, and there are repairs uh, of various magnitudes on the structures on the property. Um, and things like that. We anticipate that there's probably another $50,000 or more that we're going to have to come up with. I'm not here asking for any money. <laughs> You'll probably see us doing some fundraising. We didn't ask for money in January. We're not now. Uh, but it does look like that whole process is going to go through. Uh, as soon as we receive authorization to start spending the money, uh, we have to have an environmental assessment of the property and a survey of the property. And when those two things are complete, then I think we can set a closing date. So there's nothing imminent, but it does look like everything's going to go through as planned. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. So basically, I'm here to say thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. If, you. if you guys need any letters of support or anything, I mean, it sounds like maybe you're past all that, but anything short of money well, that you need? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly enough, I do need to respond to that. Uh, we're not asking for money, uh, and we don't consider ourselves in the business of land acquisition, but we are in the business of protecting the watershed. And there is currently another piece of property which is available, and we're in negotiations on it, and we may be back in a month or two to repeat this whole process. Mm. There is money available from the same granting organization and uh, we're optimistic that that might work out also. It's a much smaller piece of property. Okay. Well, and I would also say that the project that we're talking about here um, has some impact on, on the Glen. So, you know, and I think that, that one of the things that Krista is looking at is the ability to draw on some of the, some of the human resources and the work that's being done at the Glen already on honeysuckle <coughs> eradication. So we appreciate I, that. I can restate that uh, we at Glen Helen Association will take ownership of this property when it's closed 
and we'll keep it until the grant requirements are met, and then the intention is to merge it into Glen Helm. Mm, great. Thank Thanks, you. Sam. Right. Good Thanks. news. Great. Um, first item of old business is a. Uh, wait, oh, we skipped over Melissa. Oh, so, so I guess she's that's not here Melissa's tonight. not here. So I have a feeling that Patty's going to be making this uh, this presentation. Um, as you can see from the report, uh, Melissa has worked very hard on on trying to um, comb through the utility funds and try to find, you know, if there are any issues as far as uh, the, the bookkeeping, which we reported on the electrical fund um, last council meeting, uh, that the, uh, the actual bookkeeping in and out um, was not the same as the other, uh, the other utility funds, and that's been rectified. But one of the things that <coughs> Melissa found when she looked into this was that we have substantial amounts of money uh, and when I say substantial we're talking almost two hundred thousand dollars worth of delinquent utility bills of various types um, this is going to be a very long and, and complicated process to come up with it an overall policy that um, is fair and equitable but still lets the revenues come to the village that um, so that people aren't delinquent in their bills and anytime someone's delinquent in their bill there's always the possibility that that could be passed on to other people through an increase we don't want to do that if we don't have to but essentially enterprise funds which utility funds are called enterprise funds and essentially those funds are supposed to be self-supporting you're not supposed to take money from uh, the general fund and put them into utility funds. They're supposed to support themselves and the capital projects that go along with them. Um, the only consideration that council needs to have tonight uh, for discussion, there you can assess delinquent utility bills to property taxes. The only properties that we are talking about tonight are the, it's either four or five, and I'm sorry, I don't know which, um, but there are four or five properties in the village that if you w want to ass assess their delinquent bills to their taxes, the information has to be to the county auditor by September, second, second, Monday. Second, second Monday in September. These four or five properties that we are talking about are not rental properties. These are properties that the property owner lived at that address. So it would be like if I owned my own home and I lived at that address, I did not pay my bill, I either moved away um, and the house has still not been sold, it's property that perhaps has gone into a foreclosure state and been abandoned, something like that. These are not rental properties, these are owned by the people who were, were living there or they may still be living there in all honesty. Um, if council wishes to assess those delinquent bills to those property taxes what will happen is at the next meeting we will be bring a piece of legislation before council it will specifically list the five properties and the amounts due the amount that will be listed will be the amount of the delinquent bills plus a 10 percent assessment five percent of that goes to the green county auditor 5% of it comes back to the village for, for the time and, and that went into it. So if you assess it to their taxes, it will be paid in two installments. The next two times the county auditor collects taxes, he will collect those taxes and reimburse that amount to the village on each one of those properties. So the property owner essentially gets to pay that um, delinquent bill over a year. Um, if the property sells in the meantime, it, the delinquent bill is collected at closing and it comes back to the village. It's like a lien against the it's property. Like a lien, it's, it is a lien against the property. It's exactly what it is. Do you happen to know what those amounts are approximately? Or? Um, I believe Melissa has the dollar amount for the five four or five properties in here. Was it 18000 18, 49 
That's the one? Okay. No, no, it says we currently have 18, 18. accounts that oh, are 90 yeah. days, so that must oh. include some of the rentals. Yeah. Yeah. I, I so it's all. probably significantly right. less. Right. But I, it averages about $22,000 a year that the village is currently losing. Mm -hmm. And um, does not doing it this year preclude it from being done in the future? Uh, on those properties, yes, because you can only go back eight years, and these are at the end of their, they're from 2006. Okay. Well, I, I think we should look at this legislation I mean, at our next meeting. You know, there are some other um, there are some other steps in here that uh, Melissa has recommended, and she and I have talked about. But as I said, those are for a far more lengthy discussion, right. and will take some more time to put into effect. But um, on these five or six, pro four or five properties, we need to decide because we would need to prepare the legislation for the next meeting. Um, and I, I'd like to hold most of the discussion um, until Melissa's here to, to talk right. with her about it. But you know, this is this is a relatively painless. I mean, I know it's still going. People are still going to have to pay them, but um, it's better than sending a <coughs> bill collector after them. It's better than um, turning it over to a credit agent. You know, so it's yeah, it's. I think that, it, and we have to. This has been a discussion. This has been a concern for years. Uh, Two hundred thousand dollars. It that's. There's probably 15 or 20 years worth of overdue. I mean, we're, we've obviously lost a lot of that. Um, we'll never recover it. Um, but we have to start a plan. And this, to me, is the first step. I'm so happy Melissa just kind of jumped into this. And I want to support her efforts. Mm -hmm. do, yeah. do we need the other thing? It? The other thing yeah, she's do doing is um, sending a lot more notices, <coughs> you know, being mm -hmm. more persistent on our end about these overdue accounts um, which is just seems really basic but apparently we hadn't been doing that and we're also working just like the the announcement was in that that Emily sent out um, about the the uh, electric subsidies the electric the electrical bill help we're we want to work with people I mean we're not trying to be you know shut off people's water shut off people people's electric we're we're about trying to work with folks and the the police department even has the ability that's part of what some of those funds are able to be used for maybe not further into justice I shouldn't say that that would no, get no, me in no. trouble no um, <laughs> but but there but there is emergency help the churches there is some local emergency help if, if people are really needing it so um, this isn't about being um, heartless this is about trying to help the entire community Sue yeah. Thank you for taking my comment. <clears throat> this came up many years ago when Joe Lewis was on council. And at that time, there were two issues that needed to be uh, discussed. And apparently, from what I recall, had a lot to do with how come the decision was made to not put it on the property tax. And those two elements were one of fairness and the other of privacy. And I know you're not talking about rental properties tonight, but you will be. And I think that it would, it would be important to, in fairness, consider giving the landlord a tool to know whether they are having a liability that otherwise they have no way of knowing mm -hmm. unless village will answer honestly the question that I as a landlord would call up and my tenant is leaving are they up to date on their utility bills I need to know that mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that I wouldn't need to know that right along because if my tenant is in arrears <coughs> that builds up and that's a liability mm -hmm. However, as a citizen and in favor of my renters, that's their private business, that's their finances, and do I have a right to know what their financial situation is beyond do they pay their rent? And that's the privacy issue that I was bringing up. And I think those two things need to be carefully thought through because I think, A, it's not fair to expect landlords to cover and subsidize renters' utilities, which is what we're doing now. All of us are now. 
if you do this legislation, then it would be just the landlords subsidizing. I am in 100% agreement that the village needs to collect its bills that are due. I'm just asking that you consider giving a landlord a tool to use so that they can control their liability for a big financial bill. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. There are actually some, um, and Patty can probably speak to this. I, I've talked to Melissa about that, and there, just the rental discussion is a big discussion, and she's researched a number of options for protecting landlords for <coughs> providing information, but but not um, you know not delving into privacy, and and you know these are. These are situa things that happen in every community that has utilities. So um, communities have figured out how to deal with it, and I think most of them actually do assess property tax. And, and there are some tools that, that can be given to you as a landlord to help you with that, and, and we have a couple of ideas on that. And so it, it is definitely all going to be part of the discussion, and we, we understand that that is a liability for landlords. Thanks. Uh, Taki? <coughs> Hi, Taki Manolakos. I have, a, I guess, a comment on the 18 or 19 <coughs> active accounts, uh, which is a small proportion of the, uh, the amounts that are delinquent. Uh, so of those active accounts, I'm concerned, I think, that, you know, uh, there's a perception, let's say, that the village of Yellow Springs is about to do a Detroit. Uh, and I would urge council, at least for the subset of those that are residential accounts, when you send your disconnect notices and so forth, you mentioned there's some information about income assistance and so forth that you include in that an option for people if you're going to do that. And we, we do put, uh, for instance, on the bills that just went out, there is information on, um, on uh, stop your time. <laughs> um, there is information on the bills that just went out about the assistance program, and we, are, we do have other options that we provide people with the information if it's someone that um, is a little bit behind on their bills. Uh, the, 18, the 18 that you're talking about were 90 days or more behind. Okay. Um, but um, there, we do try to provide that information to people if we know that they're having a difficult time. Okay. Thank you. So. Thank you, Taki. Emily, did I see your hand? Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, your name. Oh, I'm Emily Seibel, um, citizen. Here we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I'm just, I guess I haven't really thought a whole lot about this issue, but it just occurred to me that foreclosures are very expensive and liens um, through the property tax, uh, through the auditor's office, would, can lead to foreclosure. And so you would be making that step um, of sort of creating severe consequences for not paying, which could result in increased revenue. but if it led to foreclosure because people are genuinely struggling that could end up costing uh, the community and the county lenders a, a lot of money so it's just something to consider maybe there are additional interim steps but i'm sure you've also explored the issue pretty fully thanks emily uh, if, if i'm correct we're talking about accounts are, are eight years old is the reason why we're we're acting on these now because that, yeah that's correct know, so you know <laughs> Yeah, and if the property owner that lived there eight years ago that incurred the bill right. does not still live there and own the property, then you can't assess it. Right, right. I mean, it doesn't go against the other person's property that has, if they've bought, sold the property in the meantime. Yeah, but, but I guess I'm speaking for, for us that, you know, if we continue to have delinquencies, you know, in order to cover it, my bill might have to rise. And, and I'd have a problem with that. You know, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm not being, uh, not empathetic, empathetic to those that can't do, but, you know, after eight years, uh, that kind of means that we as the public have been supporting those folks for eight years. And, it, you know, we've got to step up to it, so. And there, it, there is one last step if, uh, before this would get assessed to the, to the taxes. If council were to pass the legislation at the next meeting to go ahead and do these 
uh, four or five properties, they would then get a certified letter in the mail that said to them, this is how much your outstanding bill is. You have until this date to pay this bill in full. And if you don't, then it will be assessed with the additional 10%. So they are given that one last chance um, even after council passes the legislation. Thanks, Patty. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we ask Patty to bring legislation to the next meeting that would um, allow those properties um, or those those delinquent bills to be assessed to the property. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Will the specific property owners be notified that this is going to be happening at our next meeting? Since their names will then be on the legislation and address. no 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 their their names won't be on yeah, the legislation yes they will yes, yes they will they will yes so not normally but if that's council's wish we can make that happen I would I would like to do that yes um, okay now next on the agenda is the discussion about the uh, the pesticide moratorium and. Um, Patty and I, it's something that, that staff has been um, concerned about because we do have a lot of property. Um, we have a lot of weeds, you know, all of this property around here, all of the property we own, farms, we own an electric substation. It is um, all, almost all rural property. So there's a lot of weed, there's a lot of pest, con a, a lot of overgrown um, materials. and it's really becoming a problem for staff. Staff has been wanting a resolution to this, um, and I've, I've talked to Jason a couple of times. I got a call from Kent about it, and I said, um, no, we just need to hold right now. We haven't discussed it. Um, the community needs to have input. Council needs to discuss what we're gonna do. So um, this past, past couple of weeks, we've been working on it. Lori and I met with, um, with Patty. Um, I had talked to Nick Budis, I talked to Kat Kristen, um, Macy Reynolds, um, so we're getting input from the people in the community. I've talked to, um, okay, I'm, I am forgetting everybody's Nadia. name, <laughs> Nadia. Um, I talked to Nadia, so, so we've been getting a lot of input on um, more contemporary practices, more safe practices, um, integrated pest management is, 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 the, is the current terminology. Um, I know, you know, pollinator friendly practices are important. So um, we're, we're trying to, to look at it as a, at least a two step process. First, we have to deal with our property and we have to deal with staff, or with our staff and our property because something has to happen. I mean, we've got to deal, deal with the weeds that we have on our own property. So that is what we're gonna be talking about in the near term. A longer term discussion will be um, what um, uh, this idea of would we have a, a moratorium or what what kind of legislation might, might we pass that would impact the entire community um, and will we do that but I see that as a next step I don't know that we really need to talk to it to, about it tonight um, I think it's something we need to investigate it, probably nothing's going to happen between now this growing season so if we have something in place for the springs when people are, are ready to start I think that that would be um, would be helpful so Patty if you would um, talk about what you're recommending and maybe one just one more quick point that maybe Patty was planning to say is that we have a streets and parks crew so everything that's happening on the streets our street people are, are, are involved with um, all the snow clearing in the in the winter um, and they're they're responsible for the parks so it's a lot of work for a, a pretty small crew um, so extremely labor-intensive methods are just not practicable so we are trying to balance I would say that kind of the the desire to be as as gentle on the earth as we can with also the reality that we have small staff to do, to do the work. Right. Um, but to build on what Karen and Lori have said, um, integrated pest management is, is certainly an option. Um, it's, 
it allows you a little bit of flexibility to be a little more aggressive if, if the need arises, but in general, you have a, a fairly benign um, system that you use. Uh, you could use, there's been a lot of talk about using vinegar um, as um, an herbicide. Um, you have to use a, a re you can use a regular strength of vinegar if you mix it with, say, Epsom salts and Dawn dish detergent, or you can get an industrial strength vinegar. Um, but that has the potential to cause some, some burns, um, so that's not always the best option. Uh, a burn torch can be used in small areas, but again, that's very labor intensive. Uh, you have to actually go up to each weed and burn it, and if you use it on sidewalks, it can cause pitting and cause deterioration in the sidewalks. You can use sheet mulching uh, where you lay a sheet across the area and it essentially it kills back the vegetation, um, but that has to remain in place for a long time and if you take it off, it, you, the vegetation could potentially come back. Um, one of the things that um, we were able to gather, Kat Kristen had forwarded to me a link um, and on this link were chemicals that were approved by the USDA for use on organic farms. So if the chemical is on this list, it can be used on a certified organic farm. The, the USDA will actually go out and do inspections on these farms to make sure that their practices are organic and will certify them organic. Um, on this list, there were, I shared the link with Jason, there are four products that he was investigating in a little bit more depth. Bear products, safer products, BioLink, and BioSafe. Um, he has heard good things about the Bear products in, in, uh, specifically and that he was trying to do a little more investigation into those. But um, my recommendation to council is um, for the village properties um, that we allow Jason, who is uh, licensed at, to spray pesticides and herbicides, we allow Jason to choose a product from the list um, provided, you know, the USDA certified list. He will spray the, normally the crew comes in at five in the morning to do street sweeping. He can spray early in the morning in the public areas uh, generally, a chemical is t considered to be dry or rain-proof within an hour. If he sprays early in the morning, this would allow plenty of drying time in those areas before there's heavy public foot traffic. So we would be using a product off of the list of the, that, that is approved for use on US, USDA certified organic farms, and we would be spraying in public areas in the minimal foot traffic times and giving it time to dry before there would be a lot of activity in those areas. Would you also be notifying the, the public that that area is to be sprayed? We could put up signs that there would, you know, how, just like they do at your house when they spray your lawn. We could put no, up I'm the signs. I'm talking about prior to the actual um, That is wasn't it, part of the plan, but it could be, if because uh, we know when we're going to spray, so. Yeah. And, and we know where what our public areas are. That right. Gonna, so, you know, if, if, if some and type of notification could be put up early enough to to let him know that this area will be sprayed. And if I'm not mistaken, he we're not talking about broadcast spraying over large no. lawns, right? No. We're, we're going to let the clover bloom in right. most we're, of we're the, talking about, the gaunt uh, park lawns, etc. Right. Cetera. We're, we're talking strictly about fence rows, uh, perhaps the sidewalks downtown if the, you know, the weeds are growing up, but that would be done early in the mornings. Um, just areas like that. We're not. We're certainly not talking about broadcast spray. You speaking of the sidewalks, I think. I think something that that really doesn't get mentioned is the damage that the weeds do to the sidewalks and to the asphalt. So um, I mean, you can see it cracks. It cracks, and it's it's. So I think that that's another important important issue. I know that we have. Um, a lot of our gardeners here, a lot of our professionals here that I would like to hear from. Can I ask one question? Sure. Um, are we talking about herbicides and pesticides or just herbicides? At this time we're only talking about herbicides. I'm, I'm assuming we, we don't and that's the one thing I did find with the um, 
um, with the integrated pest management is that it really is more about critters than it is about right. about weeds um, and that there seems to be more issues around those chemicals that are to kill yeah. right and, and, and the only reason uh, to be honest with you Mary and the only reason I included uh, pesticides was because it was my understanding that the incident at the pool um, last year was because of the bees. There was concern right. about yeah. bees. But it, it was, was to kill the clover. It was to kill, kill the clover. clover. Yeah, yes. not to kill the bees. But I, I think just generally the word pesticide though is meant to include herbicides right. too. General. Yeah. Um, so any comments from citizens? <laughs> Macy and Nadia are looking at each other. <laughs> um, I'm Nadia Malarkey. I moved to Yellow Springs 30 years ago this week, and I never thought 30 years ago, and I moved right next door to Sue and Paul Avignon. <laughs> um, this is a big issue, uh, and I think this will be something to present maybe for the next discussion. Um, there's a lot of issues that have to do with weeds to question, well, how do you identify a weed? Um, what is the real-time factor? Maybe we can budget more jobs for this kind of work since it's environmentally healthy to be doing that. So looking at an overall budget. So I'm thinking long-term, not just a, a one-shoe-fits-all. Um, identify what is a weed, the noxious weeds like ragweed, the cold, allergies I can understand, but fence rows, you know, maybe we need to shift our paradigms a little bit about what we expect to see. Um, it doesn't have to look like rubbish, but there are alternatives that can be used as we start to redefine space and the management of space. Um, I'm very involved with environmental issues through my work, and it, it is a passion of mine, and I'm very concerned about the impact environmental chemicals are having on children. And I feel that they are the voiceless in our community, and I feel that as leaders in this community, we owe it. It is our trust to protect the health and well-being of our children. The more research I did, the more I thought, well, there's all these chemicals that go on, and when the bee, the, the pesticide issue happened last summer, I realized how little the community knows about these chemicals, that they, they're up in an uproar because of this one time spraying and yet their neighbors are spraying six times a year applications that on a total amount end up in our water and in the waterways and also have really detrimental effects on the endocrine systems of developing children and their brains which if you know about brains and children they're crucial times in the development of a brain if something halts that they are faced with lifelong learning disabilities and health issues. So this is the research that many of us have done for years. So I did more research, and I know my time's running out, but what I am proposing is that we look at the implementation of the Wellhead Protection Management Plan that was established in October of 2001 and was disbanded by council because they felt our water was safe. After what's happened in Toledo, I think we need to sit up and think about, do we have a protection plan? What are the sources of possible pollutants that are entering our wellhead? Because if we don't have clean water, nobody's going to move, want to move here. And I feel that for the sake of our children and the health of our community, it is our responsibility to protect and safeguard the health of our citizens. Um, I have a team of five or six people so far who are involved. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. You need to do something stop. about that volume. <laughs> yeah, I wish there was. Is that it? Go ahead. Finish, okay. finish, finish yeah. what you're so saying. So I, I called around, and I'm sorry this is such short notice, but um, it, it was one thing that I've been wanting to do, but I've been really busy with work. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a team of environmental scientists, people who have dealt with um, invasive species, uh, going, returning to disturbed soil and how to deal with their mitigation. Uh, I have someone who works with the Miami Conservancy who is willing to serve as a citizen and, and share their expertise. I have myself who I'm already working on education in the community. And one thing I, I would like to stress is that this plan, if, you, if anybody has not seen it in the village, you should read it because to me it is the blueprint that we should take on for future development of our community. Economic, business, um, think about low impact development. This is our water, this is our future. Without clean water, none of us are gonna be doing anything much. So um, 
It's a comprehensive plan, brilliantly put together. Um, it's a blueprint for how to continue with, with implementation of education. And the piece I really like about this is it focuses on education of the community, which to me is key, because that is when you get voluntary participation. You don't, you will not need to make mandates and ordinances because people, I think, for the most part, of their own accord will respond. And I'd like to leave this document here from the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2012 where they did recent um, information on the impact of chemicals on children. And um, thank you for giving me extra time. Thanks, Nadia. And for folks who are interested in reading the Wellhead Protection Plan, it is linked on our website. Um, I think, I don't know if it's in the utility section, but you could probably just in the search bar just write Wellhead yeah. Protection Plan and find it. Um, other comments? Paul? Then Joan? Macy? Paul Abendroff. I make two or three trips a day up Quarry Street at 23 miles an hour because it's fast as fast as my car will go. And I often see students from Antioch walking in the street because the sidewalk is blocked by vegetation. So they walk in the street. I looked at the vegetation, there's multiflora rose, and there's poison ivy, as well as the others. That might be a good place to demonstrate alternative um, methods of controlling noxious weeds. If volunteers want to get together, maybe you could reactivate the Environmental Commission and they could oversee some projects, much like the <coughs> Energy uh, Board and, the, uh, and so on. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Joan? John Edwards, first, first I want to thank uh, Nadia for all the work that she has put into this and to say that um, I support wholeheartedly everything that she said about the hazards of these chemicals to developing brains, developing endocrine systems. We will not begin to know until probably 30 years from now what the hazards have been to our children of these things. And it's not just the children that we owe this to. We owe this to um, the, we owe this to be the voice of uh, creatures that cannot have a voice. And that includes our pets. And it includes our wildlife. It includes our birds. It includes the pollinators, the bees. We have got to be better about taking care of our environment. We simply have to be. Um, I think that I know that the, um, that the staff is probably fairly stretched thin. However, there are alternatives. I have working for me a 15-year-old neighbor who is part of the education in this community. And she has to do 45 hours of volunteer uh, community service as a result of her education. And she said to me, can I come and work in your garden? And she knows a little bit about plants. She is learning as a result of my big mouth a great deal more because I know a lot about growing plants. And I don't use pesticides or herbicides. Um, and I do have poison ivy on my <laughs> arm from pulling poison ivy. So I know that that is a, a, a plant that we do really need to eradicate. And I see it everywhere on um, village property. And I don't think that spraying um, an herbicide is the answer to that. I think that we need to look at the things that are um, more accepted in the organic community for eradicating such things. But I really do want to say to Nadia, thank you very much. And um, if there is anything that I can do to be a part of that, I will. But she's assembled um, a really excellent group of people who will speak to the dangers of this. Um, and I know that um, Jason has had training in it. However, the training um, is only the beginning of learning about what the chemicals are because that training says, oh gee, this is how I put it on. And um, uh, I know that you know that that 
process wasn't followed properly. Um, and I would like to recommend that not only do you tell people that it's been done, but you forewarn people if you're going to put an herbicide around, because if you're going to put an herbicide around my property, I need to know that. And I need to know that it's been applied. And I know the last time around, it sat there on the ground for three days with little tiny children crawling on it. And it just still infuriates me. Thank you, Joan. Macy? You came to the meeting, you might as well get up and talk. No. <laughs> get your money's worth. <laughs> Macy Reynolds. <clears throat> I think when you're talking about these chemicals, um, you need, the problem becomes, what kind of plant you're putting them on. I mean, I think the vinegar would work fine on poison ivy. I'd sure try it. And we do that at the women's park. We use a lot of the vinegar on the uh, stone areas. But, and we don't use any other herbicides. But when you have something like honeysuckle, you have to kind of weigh, what are you going to use? And the vinegar is not going to work on that. And so the, the best practices are to cut it and then just spray a little bit or even take a paintbrush and do it on the stalk. And that, the Glen uses it, um, I know they use it uh, all over the park districts here. And I know it's a chemical, it's, a, it's one that we don't fully understand yet what its consequences will be. But I think when you use just that little bit, I wouldn't rule it out as one of the chemicals you put on because it is just about the only thing that works on some of the harsher things. Uh, Bradford pear, uh, the honeysuckle, and some of the other uh, tree of heaven, sometimes it works on, sometimes not. And you're talking about Roundup? Roundup, a glyphosate. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually that uh, shrub uh, strength one brush strength, I think they call it. So uh, do think about that one before you come up with a list, if you're going to make a list, because I think you need to allow a little bit of it and use it as judiciously as possible. Thanks, Macy. And thanks for all your work at the Women's Park. Um, Macy and, and um, Anna Belisari from the Tree Committee are now doing um, the garden. Um, so they're going to start doing the garden work at the train station. So they, uh, they contribute a lot to the beautification of Yellow Springs along with a lot of other people. So thank you. Um, any other comments? Um, yeah, uh, the idea of using chemicals that are um, approved for organic farms seems reasonable. But I also think that we have such a wealth of resources in the persons of some of the some of the people sitting here that it seems to me it might make sense to get Nadia or Macy or some of the people that they've been mentioning to actually go around with the village crew to look at what are the issues because maybe there are some places where nothing needs to be done maybe there are some places where some volunteers can pull things out maybe chemicals but and I think this is going to be more of an issue as we start talking more about how we manage village property so yeah. I guess I'd like to use the resources that we certainly have and I think my sense is that, that people here are happy to be involved in that way yeah I was actually I had the same idea that Paul had that we we have the Environmental Commission it's just been kind of decommissioned for a while mm -hmm. um, uh, and it I think it might make sense to bring it back um, Marianne is actually down one committee she needs something to do so she needs <laughs> she, we want to keep her busy and off the streets so um, I think it would make sense I'm I personally I'm okay with with this as a, a, a sort of stopgap, if there's things that he's really seeing are interfering with things that the village needs to do, um, the certified organic chemicals, I'm I'm okay with that. Longer term, um, I, I think, and maybe m even more immediately, uh, Marianne's suggestion that maybe uh, a group of the people that um, Nadia has collected could go around with Jason if he get you know to uh, look at the, the areas that he believes are, are the biggest problems and see if if there are um, what what the best what what uh, well, what alternatives or options there are for those spaces I, I, well, I think you also to need say. to include Joe Bates because I want to hear from Johnny he, he has yeah. some areas there. Yeah. sure sure yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, good point. I think one of the big areas that I'm most concerned about is the substation. Uh, I had guys out there for three days, uh, one on a lawnmower, two on weed eaters. The problem I have is, is then I got to have a fourth guy there to watch them to make sure that they don't get into something. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when they're hitting a weed eater, if they hit a rock, 
and it flies and hits a porcelain insulator, then we got a major power loss. And you don't know what that power is going to do when it cracks that insulator. It could go to different phases. It could be a bad situation for three guys inside a cage. I would apt to, or I would want Jason to try the substation. It's kind of by itself, try that with the organic mm -hmm. uh, as a test station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, and, and I, I agree. I mean, I think, and I'd like to see, I'd like to see people go out you know, sooner than later, because if we wait too long, then the, there, we're going to kill some weeds, and then it's going to die off, and then we'll come back in the spring. and And I'd like to have a plan ready for yeah. to, for when things start to grow in the spring. So, um, it seems to me that you know maybe starting a little bit of education, but giving Jason some leeway. This. Um, understanding that that it's late in the season we're just now getting started and we may not have time to pull together everything we'd like so you know the organic is as, as, as uh, Lori said the organic um, organically approved I think seem fine and but but maybe before he does that spraying get some of our resources get some of our folks out to look at what's out there and say okay what can we do differently next year so I, I guess I would like to make a motion if Marianne, and here if Marianne would be willing to, um, to kind of be a lead person on, on coordinating the citizens and the, All right. and the village staff. Okay, sounds good. Second. Okay. I'll, you want to do the all in favor? All in favor, <laughs> signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> So, but are you talking about specifically about the environmental, maybe exploring well, the I environmental she, commission? She can figure uh, out if that seems like the, the best way to go. Um, I, I think it might, might not be a bad idea. Okay, so I, I thought you were referring to the getting uh, people like Nadia and me right. together. Yeah. That's, that, the that's, main, that's, that's sort of the first start. step, but if, if, if yes. as this develops, you might, you might end up deciding that, yeah, it would make sense to get that environmental commission yeah, kind of reestablished to do the mm -hmm. the bigger picture of the water supply and all of that um, and so that would be a that would be a bigger um, sort of second step okay so just just to clarify then at this point is our, is Jason still on hold oh no just, we haven't actually made a, a yeah, clear okay. motion in yeah, that regard um, but I I think I, I I am okay with your proposal as a, uh, as at least a temporary measure to um, you know that he should buy one of those and use it if he can if he if he can feel like he can get together with Marianne and a few of the people to to look at the mo the most serious problem areas maybe starting with the substation that would be great maybe even before he buys the chemicals or that. even maybe even as he's spraying or or before he sprays or even take photographs I mean if nothing else I mean mm -hmm. if, if people can't get out to take a look at the specific areas maybe take some photographs so we can identify what what the weeds are what the problem materials are and there's, if there are alternative right I was gonna say I mean because if it hasn't been ordered yet and we do have a group that's mobilized I mean sitting down and talking about that tomorrow or you know just and I'm mean, not delaying the ordering but if those of you who are interested who spoke tonight will see me after the meeting so that I can get your contact information so that we can get that all together. but I think Patty what you're asking and, and what I'm hearing is you have a proposal you have a proposal what to do and the question is can Jason go ahead and do that Correct. okay and we've been we said yes and no. And well, we I think what we're saying so, is yeah. yes, he can. Okay. If he needs to, gotcha. it would be good if before he actually makes that final call through, if we can get a quick meeting set up to see if that's if it's the best way or necessary. But that we're not going to stand in the it's way. It's possible to do that this week. But yeah, Jason was off today. Um, I don't know what his schedule will be the rest of the week since we are getting ready to start the limestone project yeah. but I he see, will be see, back and, tomorrow and, and, see and my concern is 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 that you know you're kind of putting everybody on hold and right mm -hmm. depending on how long again it takes these folks to get together and they want to talk and so forth 
you know, we, we, I don't think we can push this out a month, can we, Johnny? You, got, you guys got to. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be back in there in about 10 days. Yeah, so, I'm, I mean, they need. I'm fine with spraying. I, I support the spraying and the purchasing of the, of the, of the spray that they're talking about, the, the organic. organic. Um, my only thought is documenting what's there. Um, because what I, what I he have heard and read is that you can, you can tackle different materials with different chemicals and with different strategies. So I would at least like to document what we're killing. What I mean, we're, we're ideally, if somebody right. could go out yeah. and look at it, okay. great. If they can't, take pictures, do something so that we can document what's out there and what the situation is so that for 2015, for next year, we can be we can plan better right and I and I and I agree that the goal should be to have a better long-term plan than to just go out and spray and it, but on the other hand Jerry is absolutely right that we have some areas that just need to be taken care of because it, you know not only are we right now spending I mean three days just at the substation and and that's one of our, our facilities so you know if if we can short term do what we've talked about and then long term perhaps get a, a better plan for, in place for next year so that everybody's on the same page when the growing season starts I think that would be a good a good way to proceed and we can certainly document with pictures if, if folks can't get out there before we do that so so we're going to be doing two things concurrently Jason right. can order the chemicals and start doing whatever spraying needs to be done and I will work with you and Nadia and Macy anyone and the try staff to get, try to get, get a meeting people right. to go and see the see the places and if they've already been sprayed they've been sprayed mm -hmm. yeah I, well I mean even if even if Jason came back and ordered chemical tomorrow it's going to be a week uh -huh. before right. he gets it yeah. so hopefully we can make both mm -hmm. of those things happen okay. and, you know so. Great, thanks. Uh, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Is it Nadia. possible to not be spraying at this point where any children will be playing just to make that deposit? Hopefully, the electric yeah. substation they will. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> right. Once you're it, it's okay, they're organic. Because one thing I don't know if many of you know, many organic chemicals are extremely volatile and highly toxic, like pyrethrins. Right. Are, you know, so so I'm not going to argue that. I'm just saying, is it possible at least until right. there's a long term mm -hmm. plan to Preserve and safeguard. It, primarily, primarily the areas that, that we're talking about are um, our facilities where, uh, and by facilities I mean where Johnny's crew stores their equipment or, you know, the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, Some place well aware, well away from where children would hopefully be. So, I yeah, I think that's reasonable. And then we'll do with bees later. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you all. all. Right. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, um, Maveca, Miami Valley Educational Computer Association um, have, has been doing some work and we have a, a local group that's been doing some work on uh, municipal broadband. I see that uh, Thor Sage from Maveca is here. Come on forward and talk to us. Well, thank you. Uh, just see, I put together a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation just to remain organized and I opted to print it out just to be as expedient as possible. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a kind of a pain. Yeah. <laughs> and I did bring some extra copies if anybody is interested in my notes. <clears throat> so yes, I'm Thor Sage. I'm the executive director at the Miami Valley Educational Computer Association. Located right here in Yellow Springs in the Morgan Building. We're uh, perhaps one of Yellow Springs' uh, best kept secrets. Um, we are a not-for-profit IT shared services organization and we have been serving public school systems across a six county region for approximately 34 years and uh, we have been providing services outside of the K-12 sector to governments, higher ed and other nonprofit agencies for about four years. Uh, the, the services we provide include managed voice over IP phone services, managed wireless, internet access, server hosting, uh, software hosting, software support, remote backup, and many, many more. Essentially, we're the go-to people for public school systems um, when, when it comes to technology issues. One interesting thing is that 
the K public education years ago when the technology craze began, they, they pooled their resources in an, in, in an effort to develop organizations like the Miami Valley Educational Computer Association. By the way, people uh, call us MAVECA, um, if, if that makes it easier. Uh, but the school districts pooled their resources um, in, in an effort to uh, develop shared service agencies that could, that could allow each of the, those school districts that needed technology services to avoid recreating the wheel over and over again in each and every school building and in each and every school district. That kind of uh, shared service delivery mechanism has never really existed for local governments. Um, because Maveca is a council of governments, uh, we're in a unique position to assist governments throughout the region in uh, developing more sophisticated technology delivery systems. Uh, the primary reason I wanted to come this evening is because we've got a, a bunch of exciting things happening uh, throughout the region and I thought that the uh, Village Council would be very interested in knowing about some of these things. Primarily, there's been a lot of talk about fiber infrastructure, about the, the Village's capacity to, to uh, be a technological player, to attract new business. Uh, you know, technology as an asset where economic development is concerned are all very, very important of the uh, current dialogue here in the village. Um, Maveca, being located in Yellow Springs, actually has an enormous benefit to the village that the village may not know about. Um, and so what, what essentially we do by providing internet services to a large number of school districts is we buy bandwidth in bulk. We assist school districts in developing fiber optic infrastructure to avoid recurring costs associating with leasing fiber optic infrastructure. Um, and, the, um, and currently we have a six county wide fiber optic network. Um, the vast majority of that network is leased. In fact, Maveca spends approximately $64,000 a month on leased fiber in order to deliver network services to public school systems. Um, the benefit of building private fiber, of, or I should say publicly owned fiber, that we can deliver those services across, across is, um, is multifaceted. There are many, many ways to utilize publicly owned fiber optic infrastructure. Um, Maveca features at our data center located in the Morgan building a connection to the Ohio Academic Resource Network. Uh, we actually have a new um, uh, connection coming in that's going to give us a 10 gig connection to that particular network. We also have a redundant interconnection internet connection to Time Warner um, and, the, uh, they, and we also utilize Time Warner for a large number of, the, of their lease fiber assets. Um, we also have AT&T fiber in our data center. Additionally, we're working with Cincinnati Bell, uh, Cogent Communications, ComNet, and Consolidated Electric uh, in order to bring more internet service providers into the Maveca data center and essentially into Yellow Springs. All of these service providers are going to have to build fiber into our region and by working closely uh, with Maveca, the village is in a position to really take advantage of some of this fiber optic construction that's going to be occurring as a result of our normal day-to-day -day activities. Um, one interesting thing that we're doing is we're, uh, we've teamed with the Ice Miller uh, Law Firm out of Columbus who's been very active in assisting agencies everywhere in, in winning local government innovation fund dollars. What we're doing right now is we're working on a plan to build an 89 mile fiber loop through Greene County, down into Clinton County, and across to Fayette County and then back to Yellow Springs using local government innovation fund dollars, loan dollars. Um, we decided that the grants are too competitive and um, we, we can expedite the process by going for the loan dollars. 
We already have the revenues in, uh, in place in order to repay the, the interest-free loans that are repayable across uh, 11 years. Um, so why not build public fiber it is, is, is the way we feel about it. But the interesting thing about fiber optics is that the real cost is in the construction. So one thing that we're doing with respect to our local government innovation fund grant uh, loan applications is we're developing private partnerships, public-private partnerships, with companies that are interested in, interested in building infrastructure into the region anyway. So it, by subsidizing their private builds in exchange for dedicated publicly owned strands of fiber inside the same sheath, we can essentially build a fiber network, uh, reduce construction costs or share construction costs with, a, with private agencies and with other governmental agencies, and um, get where we need to be with respect to the development of solid infrastructure. Is this all underground? No. Uh, it's a combination of both. It, it, it depends on where the fiber is running as to what is, you know, generally you go for the most cost effective option and many times that is hanging from poles. In some instances where there are no pole lines, uh, direct burial uh, is the way to go. So it varies. Okay. The key to good fiber infrastructure though is to build it in loops so that you can build in redundancy. And I could draw that out uh, if given more time, but, uh, but, but uh, take my word for it, fiber loops allow you, if, if you have a break in one area, traffic can flow back across the loop, back to the, to the location you're trying to get to. Um, fiber optic infrastructure has long-term viability. Uh, it, its capacity is scalable just based on the electronics that you place on either end. Um, you can, uh, you can reduce construction costs by, uh, by developing partnerships and in many places monetize their fiber optic infrastructure. Say if a service provider is interested in providing service in an area where there's public fiber infrastructure in place, you can actually lease fiber to a private agency in order to, to allow them to deliver service that they need and avoid construction costs. Uh, one additional thing that we're doing at Maveca is we're working with the Metropolitan Dayton Educational Computer Association located in Dayton on uh, a developing partnership which may include a, da a data center consolidation which would bring all of their network operations right here to Yellow Springs. What that would mean is that we would be actually providing service and developing a, an even larger fiber optic network that reaches across the entire Miami Valley. And all in the center of that network would be right here in town. So uh, the point, what, what kinds of opportunities does this present for the village of Yellow Springs? Well, first off, Maveca is willing and able to assist. Um, if the village of Yellow Springs is interested in, in taking some kind of approach to the development of fiber optic infrastructure, we can help you, and we can, um, well, we, and we would love to do that. There are multiple fiber optic uh, construction projects underway in the surrounding areas. Right now, we've got um, fiber optic infrastructure being built to connect the Air National Guard base to Wilmington and to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We want to become involved in that so that we can share in that project to get the fiber optic connect connectivity we need without having to, to, to foot the entire bill for all the construction costs. Um, the, uh, there's a strong desire in the, in the village uh, to position the village as a te technology enabled community. And uh, I think that that is very, very doable. Uh, there's a demand for more competition from carriers other than Time Warner and AT&T, yet again, very doable. Um, and there's significant local support. SpringsNet, a, a group of local citizens interested in the development of a fiber to the household initiative, um, has really taken a, a long, hard look at the viability of building fiber to the household. It's, there, there are possible revenue streams. There are, po there are you know, economic development uh, incentives associated with that type of build, and it's being do done in other places. So I, I would encourage you to take a good, long look at what the, the, get the SpringsNet group is doing. Um, and then, of course, there's the opportunity to provide additional services and support uh, for village functions. I mean, we're, gonna, we're looking at water plant. Uh, we're looking at, at electrical services. In the future, 
those systems are going to be automated and you are going to need network connectivity to those sites and we can make that happen. There will be an upcoming opportunity for the village to partner with Maveca in, on, in our loan application. And in return, uh, you would receive a plan for and costs associated with development of local fiber optic infrastructure to connect all of your primary locations, electrical substation, water treatment plant, uh, you know, sewage. The, sewage, all of these, all of these locations. Um, and uh, we can talk later about all of the various uh, services that can be delivered across this type of infrastructure. Um, really quickly, uh, one other thing is that uh, Mabeka has on the table a uh, proposal for municipal Wi-Fi service throughout the downtown retail area. Um, Radiant Networks, who's, who have also built wireless, what's known as what, what's what are known as wireless mesh networks. Um, in other communities throughout the state um, has been to Yellow Springs. They've looked around. They would like, and they've come up with a budgetary number of around $68,000 to put in a robust wireless network throughout the downtown region that would cover everything, say, from Mills Lawn all the way down Xenia Avenue and down Dayton Street uh, for thorough Wi-Fi access. That number, that 68000 which is just a budgetary number, includes a, a point of sale system with a, it, it's, it's a hospitality solution, if you will, that would allow visitors to the village to buy access and bandwidth on the fly using the credit card. Um, the $68,000 also includes installation. Um, there is a simply a network engineering, uh, there's an engineer, engineering study that would need to be done to refine the bill of materials, get a real number. The engineering study, I, uh, I believe, is seventy-two hundred dollars after discounts. Um, so uh, that's just kind of an update on municipal Wi-Fi, and I'm just about done. The, I, my last little note here is on next steps, and the one thing that uh, really brought me here tonight is is an opportunity to develop a better relationship with the Village of Yellow Springs to, to do more collaboration, to, to have more discussions. There's no way you can talk about all this stuff in 10 minutes. There's, it's just impossible. This is complex stuff and it requires ongoing communication. Um, I would love to see a strategic plan associated with the development of uh, technology resources in the Village just so that I can you know, so that we can all understand, you know, where we're heading and, and whether or not we want to be a quote unquote technology enabled community. And then of course that, you know, we would, I think that it would be a wonderful idea to build technology, the technology capacity of the entire community, both in our understanding of the technologies that are available and what we can do uh, with our publicly owned assets um, and, uh, you know, with the technology itself. And, and the delivery of, a, of higher quality services to everyone in town. And that is it. Was I over 10 minutes? Uh, comments? <laughs> Rob, well, questions? Um, Thor. Thor is it Thor? Yeah. Uh, he kind of presented this idea to us at uh, our Channel 5 cable meeting uh, last Wednesday. And, uh, and, and I, as we kind of talked about, we, we kind of see the to need to probably increase and figure out how we increase the membership to that particular uh, group because we, you know, and to me that would be the ideal place to have it with Brian's knowledge and technology and so forth and to be, be a splinter of that group and uh, then help advise council as to uh, the role that we should play and so forth. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so that's what I'm. That's what I'm kind of suggesting as we, we put it in put it in that group. Patty, do you have reflection um, thoughts um, regard related to the staff and how um, staff involvement? I mean, at what point um, do we need to the staff to get involved in? Um, in what our needs just will be just for yeah just hearing about it I mean I'm glad Johnny's here actually because I would say that it would probably fall in his department um, from a from a hardware function standpoint correct and um, 
I, I think that if um, I think that if we go with what Jerry's uh, suggesting and then let um, perhaps let them come back with a, a general recommendation and then in, in once we get to the point where we're starting to truly think about implementing some of the plans um, then perhaps the staff could get involved at that point because uh, you know we need to decide as a whole what the community needs and then you know more specifically the what the village as a government entity needs and work from that standpoint but um, I think the decision as to what the community as a whole, what would be best for that, would be probably best left in the hands of the committee. Community access panel. Yeah, and this is what I kind of, at the tail end of our last meeting, mentioned is that, you know, I think it's within our purview of uh, community access panel to take this on. Uh, it's definitely part of the mission, as long as that's something that council feels good about and it makes sense to me. So. Well, um, I frankly do not understand this, so I'm coming from <laughs> ignorance, but given that it seems like it could have profound economic development uh, impacts, that um, the staff person that gets hired, the next assistant, mm -hmm. who, whether it's one person or two, mm -hmm. anyway, it seems like they're possibly would be a role for that person in terms of looking at it as an economic development tool. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's a lot. I think this was, a, this was a good introduction. I don't think, I think it sounds like we've, we've made a, a commitment to a second, to the next step, which is basically to turn it over to the committee level, which I think is where it, where it belongs at this point. So, yeah, yeah and, and from, a, from an economic development standpoint, I absolutely support it. I think that, you know, that's kind of the secondary, um, the secondary um, input that, that we need to be sure that we're getting to. So, um, yeah, and actually we're hoping uh, Tim is going to come on to the, think about the panel. So, uh, but yeah, as Jerry said, I yeah. Think, I think he, he did give me a nod at the good meeting. good <laughs> so. all right because yeah as Jerry said yeah we we want to develop that capacity actually Thor is already a member of the panel so uh, so we got a good start great thanks Thor thank you very thanks, much thank you. Um, next on the agenda is um, Matthew Kirk to talk about a project that he has championed the thought bubble actually I think he's created it mm -hmm. <coughs> now, how, how long do you think you'll need? About 10 minutes. Okay. All depends how long it will be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take Who knows? <laughs> well, it's just I try not to sit for more than two hours. All right. So I've had the opportunity to talk with a few members of council about this. Uh, as Karen mentioned, my name is Matthew Kirk. I'm a village resident. As of uh, November of this past year, we moved here from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, previous to that, I spent my time uh, working both for the City of Columbus and the State of Ohio, actually doing economic development work. I was the uh, site selection manager for the state, so uh, I'm all, I'm very accustomed to the, the top-down economic development world of incentives and tax credits and grants and all of those fun things. And uh, so what I'm here to talk today about is none of that. <laughs> it's actually approaching economic development from a completely different uh, perspective. A perspective that puts people in place first. It's a philosophy that's uh, being championed. It's called placemaking. Uh, it basically is rooted in the ideal that uh, you're able to create better places by uh, engaging and involving the local people in your community. Something that Yellow Springs has a history of doing already. We're basically taking that same concept of meetings like this, but allowing opportunities to expand that audience uh, by creating an online forum for you to share topical content with the community and the community to interact back. It doesn't replace things like meetings, it's merely a supplement. Um, philosophically, you know, we, we believe that uh, you need all, all the pieces of the puzzle, right? And by broadening the funnel at the top, increasing the number of stakeholders able to share their voice, uh, we're gonna end up with better outcomes. And more importantly, we're gonna end up with more people involved in the process, which is gonna create a greater sense of ownership uh, in the community. Um, and so that's really the, the root of it. Um, our product, again, is a, it's a really simple web-based product. You'll be able to manage it 
the same as anybody updating a Facebook page. It requires that amount of kind of uh, interaction. Uh, so one thing about the placemaking concept is that um, it's thought to be a, a virtuous cycle that's not just based on the community engagement aspect, but reaching beyond that to find solutions. It's not just about coming up with plans, but coming up with actually, you know, with doing something, not just creating a document. Um, and so it's important that for us, communities that we're working with, you know, are interested in being flexible and coming up with creative solutions to their problems and informing uh, collaborations. One, I mean, what Thor just came up here and talked about, I can't think of anything that's really uh, kind of more in that wheelhouse right now. A great opportunity to form a public private collaboration here in the community, the idea of improving services, not just for people that are here, but for, you know, uh, attracting people to the community as well. Um, so really what we, you know, are, are asking of you is to buy into a placemaking philosophy. What we're giving back is uh, our service free of charge that would allow you to uh, host and facilitate these conversations. Uh, a lot of them, I think, are currently taking place on community message boards and things like that, or there's not an active forum outside of this room. Um, that's really the crux of it. So, so how do we do it? Yeah, are you going to show us, or? Um, no, I did not demo. Not okay. planning to demo. Um, just out of technology considerations and other things I find that can be a little little messy um, but it's but it's live you can go and look at it um, at any time so yeah. just go to thoughtbubble.com dot us dot us, US. thoughtbubble.us is actually our name mm -hmm. I think what I'd like to hear because um, this is something that I think Brian has specifically been um, interested in and I'm definitely interested in it from a communication standpoint I love the fact that that uh, Matthew is a is an entrepreneur that is looking to grow a business so I'm looking at him as a, as a, as a business owner also so that part of it excites me um, I think that the thing that gives me pause is how we work something like this into the into the democratic process in the official way that we have to have public meetings and public interactions. So I see it, what I'd like, you know, Brian, since this is your, right. um, since this is something you're championing, is maybe come back and, you know, how do we, inter how, how do we take this information? Because we can't, we can't use the information directly. It's how, how do we integrate it into the public process? Right, and I'll, I'll say a few things. I mean, first of all, I think it's very hard to, for you guys not to see this, and Karen and Patty and I have all saw it, so um, I think talking about it theoretically is a challenge. But um, what became of interest to me is when I think about a lot of the things that come to the Public Art Commission, or Arts and Parks, um, where, as Matthew did say, you know, if we had more ideas coming in, I think that we could then uh, make better recommendations or that commission could to council. Uh, in particular, uh, when the issues came up about uh, Ellis Park and what would be a good solution for the bridges. And you know, if there's seven people in the room, that's the limitation to the idea. So if we somehow open that, um, I think that'll help a lot. Uh, skate park is another thing where we were lucky to have AJ Warren come on and get community involvement, um, but I, I don't know that we can always count on that. So if we have another avenue to <coughs> open that communication channel. Um, so what I would imagine is, uh, and, and we can talk more about this later, that the Public Art Commission might be a place to pilot it. Um, as Matthew has said, he's offering it to the village for free. We decide what issues we put on there. Um, so you know, if we do are looking for information specifically about certain uh, park uh, projects, that's what we can focus on. Um, so it's not sort of a free for all in the way that Facebook is. Um, the other thing I thought was really cool and a part of the, the demo that we saw is the, uh, the dinosaur that roars or whatever. So rather than looking for negative comments, right. if there's something that you don't agree with, then you suggest constructively other things to look at. Right. Um, yeah, and, so. and I, I want to mention one thing just to, um, you know, Karen, you mentioned something about integrating into the democratic process. 
um, we are we are not meant to be a tool of democracy. Uh, we're, we're not meant to be um, whoever gets the most votes. This is what we do. Um, this is really just meant, again, to broaden the funnel in the local decision-making process. At the end of the day, all the meetings like this, all the procedures, all that still has to be uh, carried out. But from our end, the way we look at it is that you know, if somebody has an idea that they've shared, that they have support from, from 40 people on here, they're much more likely to be standing where I'm standing than if they were sitting at home and had this idea and were discouraged to participate in the process. Well, I, I think the biggest advantage that I saw to it when we had the demonstration um, is, it, to me, one of the best things you can do is sit around in a room and everybody can throw their thoughts in. I mean, it's it's. I, I like to brainstorm. No, no, no idea is stupid. Everybody's idea has value, and that's what your product does. It's a brainstorming tool, so that everybody can constructively throw their ideas in, and you get a lot more out of it than, as Brian said, you're limited to the number of people sitting in the room. Right. Right. Another uh, capability it has is it doesn't just limit you to, you know, you have all these ideas but you can actually see how many people support an idea mm -hmm. people can offer an embellishment on that on that on that mm -hmm. idea a way to make it better um, as well as you, you can you know constructively criticize things there are sometimes barriers to ideas that need to be mentioned because there's something that either has to work through or there's an impediment to the project going forward right. um, so all, all of those things can, can play out um, I guess uh, my experience with online forums is that, uh, I mean, so is there a mechanism for moderation because people come on and they're jerks and then I don't want to be a part of it, you know, it's yeah. too awful. You can flag um, uh, ideas and comments and right. so they can be re reviewed by an administrator. Um, more so just for, for decency versus for, for content, I guess, mm -hmm. you know. Is there the possibility that you can flag keywords, like the word stupid, ignorant, you know, <laughs> things that would normally be negative? I mean, that, that is a possibility. We, we have not built in that capability at this point in time to be able, we just have gone with the traditional, hey, flag this for review. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the easiest way to approach it. Uh, something like what you said would be very uh, helpful, but that's a, a lot more nuanced, I guess, right? Yeah. I, I think what I'd like to suggest is that we is that we ask the Public Art Commission to explore it. I think we'd need legal input. I think mm -hmm. it'd have to run by Chris. Um, so you know, whatever time frame you're, you guys are taking on a lot, whatever time frame you're feeling comfortable with, I'm I'm willing to explore it and at least understand you know how how we might apply it in a limited way at yeah. this point. Right. I mean, I think the the best approach, uh, as with anything, is to, is to pilot it. You know, find uh, mm -hmm. cause it, it, we've built it as a very flexible tool. So I mean, you can really use it for any topical. Uh, you know, the, the constraints are basically just a topic and a place. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is you want to talk about, you can. Um, we, we, the whole goal really is to to break down silos, and it's not just to have communities like the Village of Yellow Springs standing on their own. It's to be able to integrate other organizations that are, you know, looking to achieve positive economic and community outcomes to also participate in the site. And so they can host conversations right alongside of the things that you're uh, engaging on. The idea being it becomes one place then for the, for the community to go to, to find out, you know, what are the important issues that are going on and how can I participate. And again, as Brian mentioned, the idea is that you're building a community focused on collaboration. Because um, again, with the process being based on outcomes uh, versus just coming up with a, a plan or structure, we're hoping that, again, through that process, uh, people understand that they, their, their interest. So, I, I mean, I'd just suggest maybe that at, at an upcoming council meeting, you work with Public Arts Commission. I mean that that this is if every if council is in agreement to have Brian bring a proposal back to council on how we would how this would be implemented. That's had the um, it, that's had some look. We don't have to have a formal legal opinion, but it's at least run by Chris to make sure we're not um, heading in the weeds that we shouldn't be. Are you saying that the Public Art Commission would utilize it for a while to try it out and then make a, a, a little pilot? Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and again, I think my recommendation is going to be around things like the skate park, Ellis Pond, some of those things where I think that kind of input would have been really valuable. Okay. So at this point, we're just asking for a proposal. Is yep. that okay? Sounds good. All Thanks, right. Matthew. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Think we probably have five minutes. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is the budget schedule. That is very quick. I'll let Patty review that. Um, as you can see, Melissa's come up with a budget schedule to um, prepare next year's budget. Um, we are already, we've already started in, in staff meetings working on the individual budgets. Um, Melissa and I will work with each department to come up with a budget, put those together, bring them to council um, on October the 6th um, for the general fund and October the 20th for the enterprise and capital budgets. Um, then we will on November 3rd have the budget workshop which is uh, collective budget revisions prior to the meeting and then we will go through the um, readings of the budget so that we can file it with the auditor in January. Um, one, one caveat, um, Melissa will not be able to attend the December 1st meeting which is the first reading. I told her she has a pre-planned vacation. I told her I didn't think that was a big deal as long as she was here for the second one. Um, and also the other thing I would like to do, she's clearly showing these three. I think that the October 6th of just presenting the budget is fine at a regular meeting. Um, at the next meeting, maybe we can talk about the, um, the two hearings, the October 20th and the November 3rd, and decide if we want to do those as part of a regular meeting, if we want to do a special meeting, if we want to do a Saturday session. So let's, let's flesh out <coughs> the specific yeah. meetings at the next meeting. We don't need to talk about it now. Yep. Sounds good. But I appreciate you all working um, so quickly on that. Um, manager's report. Uh, I'm going <coughs> to rearrange things a little bit to get a couple folks out of here. Um, we're going to talk about um, Home Inc. first. Um, uh, you had in your packets the uh, update from Emily. Um, specifically, I would like to call your attention to uh, her request um, to um, not have to build the fence that is required by the development agreement. And I think I will let Emily kind of explain to you um, sp specifically what the agreement says is that they are to put a fence across the back of the properties. It's a straight line fence. It doesn't actually block in anything. And they are also required to still allow access to the path that comes up from the natural repairing corridor behind it. So um, Home Inc. has asked to be relieved of the requirement to uh, put the fence in so that they can devote those resources to other things um, like making the homes more energy efficient, that type of thing. Um, and I will let Emily speak be to that. Before you do, did you get a chance to walk the area back there? I did. I did. I actually walked around back there and all the way up and mm -hmm. out onto the property. Okay. You're going to speak to that after she speaks? Yeah, the, the reason, and, and I've talked to Marianne about it a little bit as well, um, the reason that we believe the requirement was put in to begin with was um, that it was perceived to be a safety feature to keep any children that may be in the homes from, you know, going out into the wooded area and perhaps down the hill. Um, since it's a straight line fence with no ends on it, I'm a little confused as to how that would right. keep them from well, going see, over yeah, there. See, I don't remember it as being a straight line f fence, mm -hmm. you know. But, yeah. Do, did you but, think we said to the I, for the those I, yards to be completely fenced in? Well, no, I okay. kind of left that up to the home main okay. and then look at it because yeah. I was kind of surprised when, when I got the call saying it was a straight line fence. That, that's what I read it to be in the development agreement. Is that? That's my understanding. So. See, and, and, and I was more concerned about there being some type of barrier back, back there. Yeah, because I, I, I. You know, being that it's a wooded area. Yeah, I, and I guess my. Wandering through the liability then falls on us is, is they fall off and into. See, right now it's not an active area, but. People living there and friends and so forth. Yeah. Comes 
more of an active area than just a and I guess I understand your point, but then my thought is still, they're still going to have access to go around the end of the fence. Did you think it was to enclose the well, entire I was, property? I was kind of waiting for them to come back to us. I oh, okay. I, I did not know that we specifically, there was a specific language in there that said they, they had to be uh, a straight line period. yeah essentially the way I read the development agreement is that it's a fence just across the back of the back property line you see and that's that that was not my my, my intent was for them to uh, assure us that they're you know these three houses that there was some protection mm -hmm. to keep kids from getting in the back there and falling over okay because kids, kids do wander. Right. So this, a, yeah. yeah, this is a pretty big thing, and it was a tiny piece. Yeah, I, I think this is this is a, a discussion long. item. Yeah, this is a discussion item. This needs to be it on the agenda. Should have come in really as a separate thing. I I honestly read I, right I, past I, it, yeah. so I didn't even yeah. didn't yeah, even see this. I'm really not prepared. Waiting till the next meeting a problem? No, I can. So, yeah, as, uh, essentially, I just. I was more requesting that the village undergoes some sort of due diligence to determine whether there is a safety issue. The reason I was bringing it up is because I'm at the point in the process where I'm doing final cost projections, you know, we're awarding contracts. And if it is not a safety concern given that, and even if we put the fence up, behind the fence will still be, it's also stipulated in the development cre agreement that the area beyond the fence would be publicly accessible. Right. So that's why I guess I, I'm just, con I grew confused as I was looking into it more. If obviously if there is a legitimate safety issue and it's the right thing to do, we would want to do the right thing. So it was more just, I just wanted to bring it up as a discussion topic as I'm finalizing the budget. I, I would like to revisit, I would like to suggest we put this on the next agenda that we, I, I'd like to get maybe a more up-to-date report on where we are on the cost of infrastructure, what infrastructure we're doing. I know that some of the some of the laterals, some things have changed about what our ex, what is being expected of the village. So I would like to see what our total mm -hmm. um, commitment to this project is. Um, I'd like to I'd like to talk about the floodplain. I mean, we we've kind of totally blown over the fact that this isn't a floodplain. No. So I'd like to revisit it's that. Not in a floodplain. The, the construction is not in a floodplain. But but if there is a flood, if if we have some of these rains that we've had the past couple of days, uh, the past couple of months, I have a feeling that it's going to be impacted. I, I want. I don't want to talk about it right well, now. I, I, I don't want to talk about it. I want to have it at the next meeting. Okay. Let's talk in, de in depth. Yeah. We have issues that we need to talk about this project in depth at the next meeting. And uh, we can maybe have a meeting, Jerry and yeah. I, and and Emily um, and Marianne, if you were involved in it originally, maybe get together and, and figure out exactly what the intent of the development agreement was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And also, um, I think Emily noted earlier that the uh, groundbreaking for the first home is um, the 15th. Not yes. Because uh, originally we talked about the 22nd, but it's the 15th. August 15th at 3.30. At 3.30. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. And I guess I just wanted to say, I think because there is some, um, because there's some bedrock, and I tested, we tested the bedrock depth of where the house is going there isn't an issue related to that um, in terms of we had structural engineering review um, but I'm a little bit I just don't know how much added cost there would be if there's bedrock where the fence posts would go so what may have been a like a sort of charming community pro volunteer project may become really expensive and so that's that's I guess why I wanted to bring it up as a topic of discussion Thank you. Okay. So yeah. we'll just have this this report in the next and with the next agenda and maybe a more detailed report from staff on mm -hmm. um, where things stand from this um, position of our infrastructure. Uh, okay. But do you do you know do you know what issues you want to have addressed? I mean, um, well, I have uh, the fence, the infrastructure, and the floodplain. Is that right? What what exactly we're providing? Um, Right. The laterals, are we, what laterals are we providing? Um, 
sewer lines, sewer connections. I understand the sewer connection is different than was expected. I don't think that it was clarified. Right. And so. Um, okay, then I'd, then I'd like to move the two items about uh, the trucks up so that Johnny can go home. <laughs> um, if, you, uh, if you look uh, down below the filter repairs, you'll see, as I reported to Council previously, we're in need of a new truck to set poles. Um, we originally thought that the price for that was, um, was that 250000 That was way up. Okay, um, Johnny has actually found a truck that is being built as we speak that we can get a brand new truck for $175,000. Um, it will be a lease truck, five years uh, of annual payments with a $1 buyout at the end. So, Johnny, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this truck that she's talking about, we actually have budgeted to replace in 2015 for $125,000. It did not make the annual inspection. We have four cracks in the turret with an estimated cost of $1,500 for them to take the pump out and weld them four lower cracks. The problem is going to be is, is it's two serial numbers away from the one that they just repaired last year that they had to get a brand new turret made, but the people had it in stock. It was $25,000. So I don't want to put the money into a truck that we're going to replace her next year. So uh, I contacted the uh, truck facility. Like uh, Patty said, I found one for 175,000. Uh, it's actually, I'm gonna put my notes here. Uh, five payments of 37,840 with a dollar buyout. That actually brings the total to $189,200. Or we just pay for it up front at 175,000. Depending on how we, fourteen thousand two hundred dollars is the cost saving that we paid up front. Uh, then that brings me to the other one. What do we do with the old truck? I have a dump truck scheduled, and that was one of the first things I talked to Patty when she come in. I have a dump truck that I'm supposed to buy this year. We budgeted one hundred twenty-five thousand for it. I cannot buy a dump truck for one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars to put mud in and gravel in just to say we have a new truck. So then with this happening, I was like, well, what if we look for a used one? Well, then I got to thinking, well, we take our old line truck. It's a 1996. It's got 5,170 miles on it. Uh, this, I, this is the truck with this the stress the truck, fractures this is in the, the turret. Right, right. Yeah. 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 yeah, the turret. Got it. So I took it to uh, a facility, and for $18,173, we're going to have them build it to a dump truck, take the mm -hmm. old truck body off. And so uh, overall for the, the, uh, the total, uh, we have budgeted almost $300,000. And with me buying a new truck and getting the other bed, uh, we would save $100,000. I like it. And so in addition to that, you can scrap the turret off the old correct. one. Correct. We can right. scrap the turret off the other one. So originally, money. you know, you're at 18000 You're probably going to get at least 1500 bucks out of the, the scrap. So you're down to 15500 But mm -hmm. I would like to, if it's okay with council, to write the PO for 25000 in case for some reason they get in there and they're like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to have to come back to you and say they forgot. And not to exceed, I'd not say, to exceed I'd say a not to exceed, time. maybe the price with right. a not to exceed. Because they didn't do nothing with the new lights or the beacons on the, on the truck right. itself. And yes. I would leave the decision with the financing unless council has a huge, has, I would leave it to staff, I would leave it to yeah. Melissa and This, and would, be com this would be coming out of the electrical fund, correct? Correct. correct. And we've actually talked to Melissa about the financing. She's more comfortable with an annual payment um, as opposed to the, the all of it. Yeah. Sounds good. And, uh, you know, if we do it that way, essentially the money's in the budget. It's just allocated right now to two trucks mm -hmm. at 125 apiece, and we're right. just going to reallocate that money over the course of and, five and, years. And save 100000 yeah. yeah. Correct. Sounds good. And I, I would just like to tell council, kudos to Johnny. He has worked very hard on this, and he has come up with these solutions, and, and I'm really very happy with what he's done. Yeah, thanks, thanks Johnny. Johnny. Really job. appreciate Go it. Go home. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your patience. No
Okay. So now. did we just turn that over to? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Turned it over Sounds a great solution. Um, and so now we're actually back to the top of the report. Um, as council is well aware, it's been in the budget for the last three years uh, to hire an assistant village manager, and no one has done it. And honestly, I don't know why, because there is so much going on in this village um, that just needs to be um, taken care of. So uh, I wanted to notify council that I will be moving ahead with that. The person that I will be looking for will have experience and training in planning, zoning, economic development, sustainability, housing, those kinds of things. Um, and I will be moving forward on that. Um, very, I actually have the job description written and ready to go, but I didn't want to do anything with it until I talked to council. So um, I will be moving forward on that because those are some very important issues to this community and I want to get somebody on board that can devote more time to that than I am able to. Mm -hmm. um, Perfect. Could, are you thinking uh, of one person as opposed to two part-time? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking one assistant village manager right now. Um, if that person uh, comes on board, it is likely that we may hire a part-time, perhaps zoning inspector mm -hmm. or enforcement person of some type to help them. Um, but I think it's more important to get them on, get them involved in the different um, economic development activities that they need to start getting a handle on. Um, included in your packet is a short report on the Clean Ohio grant, which will be coming up next council meeting um, as a more intense topic of discussion. The water plant. Can I say yes. something about that? Because um, I know Krista is going to come to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did think that um, at, at base, basically what this is about is an opportunity to take the, I guess we call it the Yellow Springs Creek right here, mm -hmm. along here. And um, if the village decides to do this, to uh, get money to remove the primary invasive species here and develop uh, a management plan long term, which would make this area much more usable for the public um, because a lot creek. of the plants will be gone. And then at issue will be how we maintain this mm -hmm. because we don't we have a small staff. Um, and I thought it was important to just put this out in the public so that maybe it'll get in the paper <laughs> so that people if they're interested will come to the next meeting or call staff mm -hmm. or call uh, call council members but also to me it raises an issue of stewardship because we own this land and it's been let just over be overgrown for forever forever are we being effective stewards of that land. I mean, first we have to look at what does it mean to be an effective steward of the land that we own. But I, I think it's a question that we need to start looking at. What does it mean to be an effective steward of village-owned land? Because if we're not going to be effective stewards, then maybe we shouldn't own it. Um, but how to be an effective steward with minimal staff is an issue. And I do think it's something that communities a lot of people are interested in. I mean, the whole issue of open space is going to become more and more of an issue for this community, I think. So I just wanted to open it up that way. Thanks, Brian. Thank um, the water plant. Um, actually, at and I, and I shared this with Brian before the meeting, at 4.21 p.m. today, I actually got an answer from <laughs> Scott Straley at RCAP. Um, in his opinion, the RFQ that I have written is good to go. It's going to go out tomorrow into the, the newspaper and the Dodge and the Builders Exchange, and we're going to get an RFQ out there to get the criteria architect for the design build. Essentially, I am still not convinced that this is a shorter process than a traditional design bid build, but at this point, I think we're too far along to back off of it. Um, I think we would waste more time doing that than we would just proceeding, and I'm not willing to do that. Um, Scott Straley from RCAP has promised his help in the designing the mathematical matrix in the evaluation system, and so um, that's I'm comfortable enough with that concept now to um, to go ahead with that. So I'll be putting that out tomorrow. 
Um, I'm sorry that uh, John Eastman left because I was going to ask him if he'd made any progress on the cost estimates for. Oh, he might still be out he's there. He's waving his hand. So um, we'll go ahead then. Uh, we've released the RFPs for the Mills Lawn sidewalk, here. the next phase of streetscape, and the upgrades to the Gauntfield Ball Park. Those bids are due on um, August the 22nd, and we'll be opening those that same day. Um, John, I know that Jason spoke with you about um, the cost of the elbow joint and that it was a little prohibitively expensive and you were looking at alternatives. I think there may be another solution. Can you give us context because okay. I don't even beaver know what you're talking I'm about. sorry, beaver, beaver We're talking dam. Glass Farm, oh, Detention right. Dam, beavers, yes. and how to maintain a fixed water level so the beavers won't keep deepening it and maintain the function of the detention pond, but doing it at less cost than the first idea. Right. So there's multiple objectives. Um, I've left Jason a message to uh, see if I can meet with him tomorrow about 1.30 or 2 o'clock. Yeah, he was off um, today. To, to, do, to go through my ideas. Um, it might be something that I think ultimately Bill Bebko would be good to include in the conversation. I don't know, Marianne, if you want to be included. But the idea fundamentally is to create a way in which the beavers want to create their dam upstream of the pipe. Um, existing pipe and an orifice by uh, and, and keep have that as a protected area with with wire mesh and then have the the pipe that would control the water level be able to be a small diameter pipe Th that was the reason for the expense was to maintain the capacity of the system for detention ponds. The pipe had to be a 30 inch pipe and the length of that pipe and the size of that pipe was just very expensive. So this will allow for a much smaller size pipe and I don't want to hear or go into the details how to do it. I'll sketch it up with Jason, we'll talk it through and um, make sure everybody's in agreement that it'll actually serve all the different functions that we're trying to serve. <laughs> because it's so many of the beaver techniques are where you're only concerned with the beavers and the water level, you're not also concerned with the detention function. <laughs> We've right. got to make sure we maintain that detention function, do it at an elevation that gives the right amount of wetlands without so much backup that you get the mosquito problems. I mean, we've got multiple competing objectives, and so me, I think the best way for, is to meet with, for me to meet with Jason, and we'll, from there we'll see um, whether we, at what point we fill Bill Bebko in on it so he's comfortable right. with it too. I mean, my uh, the primary objective is that it do what it's supposed to do, yeah. and that is to protect. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm clear there's a, I'm clear there is a way to control water level at a level that does not reduce the effectiveness of the, of the detention pond, and that the capacity of the outlet be maintained at the right place that it needs to be maintained. It's just we have to work through the details. Right. Yeah, I do have a, a consultant who I who could probably. <coughs> Thank you, John. Um, the work on Limestone Street improvements should begin this week. Um, I think they're already moving their equipment and materials into the end of President Street, and so um, they should begin on Limestone. If he gets another crew free, he'll do Cemetery Street simultaneously. If he doesn't, it will go at the end of Limestone Street. Um, the filter is online. Yay! Last Friday, the filter went online. Um, That's at the water. At the water. Plant. At the water treatment. People don't plant. always know. So uh, yeah, I'm it's sorry. Helpful to get, get the get the specifics in. Um, we will be flushing the system the week of August 18th, and the reason that we're waiting until the 18th is because Joe's on vacation the week of the 11th. Um, so the week of the 18th, we will begin flushing the system. We start down by the well field and we work our way north. And when they open the first hydrant, it's going to get really, really brown. And um, so please be prepared for that. If you live on the north side of town, you may have brown water longer than the people on the south side of town just because it's coming that way in the system. Um, it will take a week to flush the entire system. 
So please be prepared for that. We will be putting notices in the paper. We will be uh, renting a couple of signs to put out telling people that we're flushing. We are probably going to utilize the phone system to remind people. Um, you know, you may want to buy a few gallons of, of water to, to drink. Uh, the water is potable. You can drink it. It just is not going to look very pleasant. Um, so it will not harm you if you drink it. It's, it's just going to look like coffee. It's going to look really brown. So um, again, run your faucets until they run clear. Run a cycle through your washer. Run a cycle through your dishwasher. Um, if you happen to forget and your clothes get brown, we have a, a thing called red out that you just wash them again and it takes the rust out. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please call us and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. And I think that's all. Baker's Night, October oh, 31st. I'm sorry, it's <laughs> kind of down there in the middle. Beggar's Night is Friday, October 31st from 6 to 8. Per Chief uh, Pettiford. I almost said Gregory. <laughs> Can I ask a question about the streetscape project? Yes. Okay. Just to, um, when you finish getting the bids, how soon will they get to work on the streetscape project? Um, the bids come in on the 22nd of August. We'll open them that day. It'll come before council at whatever the next meeting, which I believe is September the 2nd. Um, after that, we will sign the contracts mid-September and they should start, I would think, by the end of September. The only caveat is that they cannot be on streetscape while street fair is on. So depending on the timing, they may wait until after street fair because the, the, the bid specifically says they have to be off during street fair. Okay, I have just a sentimental request before the trees go. I know it won't be Christmas time, but couldn't we maybe have another, have like a week or two where we light them up at night since it will be the last chance we have for that. We won't get to have them for Christmas this year. We're going to have trees. Because the lights are still on the trees. I'm talking about the trees before they go. I don't know that they're, that it's hooked up. I think I that they cut the, I think that they trim them and they cut out. I think that they, I have a feeling that the, that the, that they're no longer functioning. We can ask. I, I, I will ask. ask John. I was just thinking for a week or something, it would be nice to see them lit one last time. Yeah, but it, it, it does take a little bit of work to get them, get them lit. It's not. Yeah, I mean, if it's, it's just not a, a plug. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so okay. But, let, let yeah. the but I, I will ask Chrissy, and, okay. and we'll get back with you. Can I mention one thing real quick? And, and I don't know if that is aware, but I, I just noticed that today with school starting. We got a big section of sidewalk buckling on uh, West Self College, and it's it's going to be a, a horrible trip hazard because you it, it's it's under a row of trees, and it's not until you get right up on it as, as you see it, and if the kids ride his bike down through there, we're it's on West Self College. I, I'm, I'm gonna have to show you. It's, it's right across from the entrance to uh, Talos Drive. Okay. In, in oh, I know where it is. Yeah. I walked, I walked they, past I mean, it. We've got yeah. three or four different levels. Yeah, so. I walked past it yeah. in my travels. I know so, what you're talking yeah. about. It's, it's right about where the bike path picks up, the old bike path picks yeah, up that, on the outside right. of the sidewalk. Right. Maybe you can look into having a contractor come in and look at, at raising instead of just replacing all these sidewalks, mm -hmm. maybe come in and raising some of them and... and um, Jason and I have talked yeah, about... Sawing, not sawing. Yeah, grinding. Grinding. Yeah, grinding. grinding. yeah grinding. Jason and I talked about the one on Walnut Street grinding down there by that sycamore. And, uh, and then he's also talking to Wendy Van Buren about um, additional alternatives as opposed right. to digging the whole thing up. See, I'm hoping that we... Yeah. Because the, the walks have not broken. They just raised that we can slide them off and okay. grind it down and then just put it right back in place. All right. I'll ask work. about it tomorrow. So, okay. And I also wanted to pass along uh, the many compliments I heard about how the recent street improvements were managed. Oh, yes. I know we don't do that work, but we did manage it, and uh, we got heard a lot of great feedback. So I will pass that on to Jason. That was uh, that was all him. Yep. So. Okay, we obviously don't have a clerk's report. I think uh, Judy is having a nice, relaxing time. I'm seeing some nice photographs and some lobsters and. Oh. Uh, 
I think she's enjoying Maine. Um, future agenda items, I just added a uh, discussion of um, Homing Cemetery Street project. Um, I don't think we'll have the eGov discussion, will we, Brian? Because okay, because that's been, that's, that's not happening until so the twentieth. So that's going to be in September. Yep. Um, is are we really ready to do anything with the mu street musician? I mean, I don't think there's been much happen. I don't even think we're ready to revisit that. The street musician agreement. I don't. Um. I mean, if we did talk about it, it would probably be brief. On, and you can uh, talk, I, you could even mention something during public art, during your public art commission yep. thing. Um, Jerry, will we be ready for something on the council chambers? Well, Paul's got some equipment that just came in, so we want to do okay. some playing with that before we do that. So I'm, I'm going to say no. Yeah. No, okay. So the dam at Glass Farm, it sounds like I think you guys, so, so we probably will be ready for something on the, on the Glass Farm yes. project at the next meeting. So. Um, and then do you have the, uh, the TLT um, Oh, right, Tecumseh Land Trust um, proposal. I was going to ask, um, it seems like we kind of stopped having reports from committees. Not uh, really. I mean, I think we're actually doing better on that. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I know it was in the month that we did, isn't it? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, like the year-end reports oh. from. I'm like, not even. I don't think planning commission ever right. paid you know, ours. I don't I mean, think it was on. Mine did ours. We did just, ours. <laughs> yeah, I think I think most of the others did. I think. Okay, so it's, maybe it's, it's just, just planning, planning commission. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll twist some arms. Well, I thought Matt was gonna. <laughs> it was on for a while, right. and then yeah, we went just, off. I and was ready to give, but we just never had a chance to give. No, I don't know if it's well, even. I don't even think planning commission has. Well, we haven't talked about it. Well, maybe he, I honestly. Oh, you, I missed, you missed I those missed two so meetings. much yeah. <laughs> when I missed those two meetings. So, but I mean, I don't think they ever talked about it. So, um, I'm sure that there will be there will be some. It sounds like we're going to have legislation, maybe some contract legislation. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm sure that there will be legislation on the agenda. I'm sure we'll have plenty on the agenda by the time it gets. Is here. Melissa going to be here? Uh, Melissa. Yeah, Melissa will be here. She right, so we'll be talking about the. But yes, Melissa will be here at the next meeting. Uh, to talk, okay. Yeah, we'll have the legislation. Oh, that's legislation right. Legislation for yeah. that. Legislation about the um, property tax. Yeah. And then will yes. we continue to talk about the utility accounts? Or um, I think we'll see what Melissa has okay. to. Let's let's see how the agenda is mm -hmm. looking and if we can right. talk about some of those other ideas. Um, and it's possible there might be some some follow up on the on the spray on the. Um, Pesticide oh, moratorium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Depending on what, whether you guys um, are able to okay. to do anything in the meantime. Sounds good. Um, um, motion. One one thing that was brought up was the wellhead protection plan, and I know we've talked a bit about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing, one idea was that it needed to have some revision, possibly. But when do we see that? wellhead protection plan actually being adopted i think that can be part of what we're tasking the consultant the water plant consultant with uh, to look at. it's not a, it's that's not actually in the rfq that's going it's out i think that's a different uh, thing. i think it's really but, different yeah. from that um, but i mean it's certainly something i could talk to joe about updating and see you know how he would thinks best to approach it and we, we did have a presentation from um, Linda Aller, whose firm, um, Bennett and Williams, wrote the Wellhead Protection Plan. She said it's a good plan and that it just needs some updating. Okay. So she, you know, sh we could probably even get a proposal from her. You might, um, I'm sure you can find her contact information somewhere. Ruth Ann might have it. Okay. Maybe give her a call and, and see Linda Aller. Isn't can that? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I need to. Directly to the 
and then forming partnerships with area partners. It's a big issue, but it, it comes with education. Okay. So yes. that was just to keep that in mind. And, and, and that is a subject that is should also be housed with the Environmental Commission. That project should be housed with the Environmental mm -hmm. Commission that we is currently inactive. So um, getting that going again would be helpful. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, motion to adjourn. And I'd be happy to. So moved. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.